Right, gotta unmute. Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed, the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. I'm Arjuna, and today I'm going to be debating epistemology with James Fodor. He's been on the chapel on the channel a couple of times. Uh, could you just quickly tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, sure, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. So I am in the process of uh, applying for PhD programs. I just finished a master's degree in neuroscience, so I'm generally interested in science and philosophy and uh, particularly questions of um, like epistemology and how we know what we believe and comparing belief systems and things like that. Um, so yeah, interested in these sort of conversations. I just, uh, don't tell me it's echoing because I turned it off. I, I, I caught it <laughs> early. Um, cool. So. Uh, if you watch my channel, you may know me, but I'm an electrician, live in, live in Auckland, and I love debating philosophy of religion. I'm a Hare Krishna, also known as Chaitanya Vaishnavism, where we want to be academic about it. And um, today we're going to be talking about epistemology. So as you'll know, epistemology discusses the question of how we know what we know. So I make a case for... Yeah, the mic came right out. Uh, I think the mic was distorted because I had I had two sounds going on from it. Should be fixed now. Let me know. So I make a case for what I call um, it's a kind of foundationalism. I don't know if intu foundational intuitionism is quite the right word, but at least the word intuition works well. So we can have the term self-evident or the term intuition, or some people even call it acquaintance with facts. And I can't really distinguish much meaningful difference between these terms, well, of course, we can get technical about what we mean by them. But, um, you know, intuition, a lot of people hear that word and they think it's the thing that your mother is okay at, you know, <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when she packed the right kind of lunch or, you know, knew you needed that extra sweater, it's the mother's intuition. That's not quite what I'm talking about in epistemology when I mention intuition. Oh, we got Craig Reed here and just digital gnosis not a big turnout but but we got some good names um so what i mean when i say intuition is basically the way we get non-inferential beliefs or the foundational axioms of a worldview and um of course we could just assume things without giving them much thought but uh if if we have axioms that we actually know to be true i argue that we know them non-inferentially as properly basic beliefs through a kind of intuition or self-evidence. Uh, do you want to say anything back to that so far? Shake. I... Yeah, so, sorry, I just thought I'd mute myself. Um, so properly basic belief is interesting. So do you, um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of things to unpack here and it'd be interesting to see how we go with this. So you talked about intuitionism, um, you talked about foundationalism, but you also mentioned properly basic beliefs. So, um, and in some of your other discussions as well, I've noticed that you, you talk about, um, I don't know if you use the word reliabilism, but you do talk about the notion of having faculties that are um, sort of uh, functioning appropriately for us to be able to uh, access certain knowledge or arrive at certain beliefs. So that's more of a reliabilist um, approach to justification, it would seem to me. So, did, and, and that use of language probably basic. So did, what do you think about Alvin Plantinga's work on this? W would you... I, I adhere to his approach. So I do like Alvin Plantinga's work. I just don't think it goes far enough because it doesn't have virtue epistemology. Well, the other criticism people give it is, you know, you could say that, uh, I can't remember some examples people give, but you could make, you know, have something that's completely doesn't have a logical connection to the truth, which it supposedly claims. And you say, well, God designed us so that, you know, when our ear twitches, we know that he exists or something. And it's like, well, what's the logical connection between your ear twitching and knowing God exists? It kind of it doesn't follow. So that's one objection people raise to that. But the, yeah, the main objection I would give is that so in Krishna consciousness, we have this term called adhikar, and loosely we can translate it as... Um, qualification so someone with a higher degree of adhikar can access what can be called confidential or esoteric knowledge about the absolute truth or about god in the case of theism 
Um, and adhikar is increased by purifying your heart and purifying your mind, which I guess you could I- make those two things identical in a sense. So when you're covered over by the modes of material, by the material energy, then your ability to see reality clearly becomes clouded. And when you purify your consciousness, then you can see clearly. And, and an analogy I could give for that is if you say you're doing a, a, a business partnership with somebody who you trust and uh, they're actually cheating you, but you don't want to believe that you, you trust this person, you're friends with this person, and you just don't want to believe they're cheating you. So there's one piece after an, of evidence after another that they're cheating you and you just ignore all of them. And then finally, when it becomes undeniable that they're cheating you, you can look backwards and you can see clearly all of the cases where they cheated you. So in a similar way, when we're covered over by the material energy, we're, we're trying to enjoy separately from God and we, we're unable to see reality clearly. Whereas when our consciousness becomes elevated, then we, we can perceive these things. Another analogy is morality. So uh, we, we apprehend, we, we perceive objective moral truths uh, intuitively or, or self-evidently. It's, it's just self-evidently true that torturing babies is bad. So if a person thinks that it's okay to murder and steal and so on for their livelihood, uh, you can't convince them with logic that murdering is bad. All you can do is elevate their character through you know, character building discipline and so whatnot there's various ways it can be done not it can't be done in every case and when you elevate their co- character their their consciousness becomes able to perceive these objective moral truths so uh one argument i could give is uh, it follows from that you know just as there's people in lower states of consciousness who d- don't perceive some truths about reality that we do namely objective moral values similarly there's people in more elevated states of consciousness that could be perceiving deeper truths about reality and God could be one of them. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. Uh, th- there's a lot of things that you've mentioned there and I think it would be good to sort of step back a little bit and uh, at least for me to try to understand um, the positions you're coming from. So, so maybe for our audience, it would be useful if I just went through a few sort of uh, background concepts here that at least I used to understand yeah, sure. uh, the, the space here. So. We're talking about epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, essentially. So how we come to know things um, and how knowledge works. Um, And one of the questions in epistemology is the question of what is knowledge? So um, I don't necessarily want to talk about that too much today, um, but just as a bit of background, one of the older conceptions here is that knowledge is justified true belief, right? So you know something if you have a belief about something which is true and you have a justification for that. Now. There have been various objections to this, which again, I don't necessarily want to go into now, but the reason I want to mention this is because one of the big questions in epistemology concerns this nature of justification. So we think that justification is an aspect of belief generally, um, and along with, you know, being true and it being a belief, but there's a question as what does it mean for a belief to be justified? Um, and so there's different answers to that question. Um, and sort of two, two branches uh, that you can distinguish or talk about um, with answering this question of the nature of justification is they're called internalism and externalism. So broadly speaking, an internalist says that um, beliefs are justified by other beliefs in some way that's sort of internal to the mind of the believer, loosely speaking, whereas the externalist thinks that beliefs, at least some beliefs, maybe all beliefs, can be justified by things outside uh, external to um, the believer. So in the externalist view, the believer or the, the person wouldn't necessarily have internal cognitive access to the source of their justification. Um, so um, the Plantinga's view of reliableism, where you could have a reliable cognitive faculty that gives you belief about, well, anything really, in his case, he talks about a sort of a, a sense of God. Uh, that's an externalist view because you can have this source of justification that you can't necessarily um, internally access. Um, under internalism, there are differing views about how exactly one beliefs can justify other beliefs. Uh, two of the main traditional ones are um, foundationalism and coherentism. So foundationalism is a view that, uh, Arjuna, you've, you've mentioned, um, which is the view that you sort of, a, a belief is justified by another belief, which then is justified by another belief or maybe multiple beliefs. And you sort of go down and eventually you'll reach a point where there's one or more beliefs that 
don't have any justification. They're foundational and they're sort of the basis of, of your other knowledge. So knowledge is like structured in this way. Um, and then we could have discussions about how you understand the justification of those foundations. A coherentist would disagree with that and say that knowledge is not like a tree that's sort of vertical. It's more like a web. A coherentist would say something like, um, a, a belief is justified to the extent that it fits in or coheres with a, a web of beliefs that sort of all mutually support each other. And again, you can ask questions as to exactly how that works. So put, having put that on the table, I lean towards a coherentist view of justification, um, and I'm not too keen on foundationalism, um, although I'm not sure I'm strictly coherentist, but, but generally I would lean towards that. And it seems like, uh, Arjuna, you've been talking about some ideas relating to foundationalism, but also some ideas which I think of as more externalist. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying, you know, you can have hybrid views and so forth. So um, I'm just sort of trying to work out where, where you want to take the conversation or what you want to focus on. So uh, do any of those threads or, or that I've identified there seem like uh, fruitful avenues to, to talk about further? Yeah, I'm not sure I've debated a, a coherentist before, so this could be fun. First time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Although not that I've had many debates on epistemology, really, at least not not in this context. I did the Graham Oppie one. That one's worth checking out too, by the way. If you haven't, that was that one was fun. Um, I I personally find the the internalism externalism dichotomy odd. For the longest time, I didn't understand it. I've heard it explained so many times now that I think I get it. I just find it a weird dichotomy to make. Could you comment on how you think some of my views are internalist and some of them are externalist? Well, it just when when you talk about foundationalism, I think that's classically an eternalist view. Okay, so so when you say something like uh, w something self evidently true to us, that 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 sounds quite foundationalist to me. Maybe that would be a belief that we come to as a foundational belief that doesn't need any further justification. Um, and then we we sort of from that, or maybe a set of those beliefs, we infer other beliefs and we build up our system of knowledge from that. Um, Again, at least that's how it comes across when you say that. I'm not saying you're committed to that view, but w whereas when you talk about the notion of um, uh, when you talk about the notion of people who have special, uh, so I don't remember precisely the word you use, so I'll just use my own language for it. When you talk about people who have special faculties that they can sort of hone that allow them to access um, like knowledge of God or something like that, um, that sounds more like. Uh, yeah, and also you said that when people, like regular people, have something that prohibits, or not prohibits, inhibits their access to these sort of faculties, and the sort of you have to learn to develop that properly. That sounds a lot more like a reliableist view to me, where it's like a process. There's a sort of a, a yeah, a process that that is that is truth tracking that, that that reliably delivers this beliefs, but is not necessarily internal to us in the sense that you can sort of just introspect and have full access to the the structure of the justification. I think at least the way I understand it is that's the difference between um, the, the internalist and the, the externalist belief. You see, if you ask an internalist, um, how do you justify a belief? Well, they'll point to other beliefs. They'll say, well, this belief is justified because of this, that, and other, the other belief. Whereas an externalist would say, this belief is justified because of this uh, this faculty. And that, a faculty is not a belief, right? It's, it's, a, it's a thing that happens in the world. Maybe it's something that happens in your brain or outside of it or, or something like that. Um, but, but that's, I think, the, the critical difference there, at least the way I think of it. So this seems to be, I've, I've had this come up in debates on Facebook, this kind of focus on an epistemology can be trusted if it involves a sense apparatus or you know, a, a sensory faculty which you know exists and you know how it works. Is that kind of externalism? So, you know, I see a boat on the horizon. I know how my eyes work. Therefore, I know there's a boat on the horizon. Well, it all depends on how. So, you know, any of the main views is going to be able to tell a story of that, uh, why you're justified in believing that there's a boat on the horizon. Presumably, you, you are justified, right? So, but, but, but it seems to me that they'll just tell a different story. So the foundationalists might start with some sort of foundational uh, principle. Um, relating to sense perception. I, I don't want to say precisely what that would be because I think you could structure it differently. Um, and from that belief, you would make a series of inferences potentially to get to um, uh, to get to the justification uh, of that specific belief. Now, a coherentist is going to say something a bit different. They're going to appeal to other beliefs, but in, not in a linear way. And, and this is generally how I would talk about it in terms of we get, we get a belief in the 
or not, I shouldn't say get, we justify a belief in the reliability of perception based on the position that such a belief, uh, not position, the role that such a belief fills in our network of other beliefs in making sense of the world. And I can talk more about that later. Uh, whereas I think the reliableist is, is going to say, it is more just going to say that the belief is justified because it's produced by a reliable belief forming process, which is whatever the process is. Now, you see, the difference here is that the, the person doesn't have to have any knowledge of the process for it to be justified in the reliableist. It, it simply has to be formed by that process. Whereas the financialist might say that they can justify the belief based on a principle that they are for, like their belief that they are forming the process, that, that they're forming the belief through a reliable process. But but the difference there is that in the reliable case, you don't have to appeal to any belief in the reliability of the process. The process simply has to be reliable. The person doesn't have to believe that it's reliable. Right. Um, we can, I guess we can push, I'll push back on your coherentism later, but for now we can discuss my epistemology. Do you, yeah, sure. do you see a, a contradiction anywhere in the mixture of internalism and externalism on the epistemology I put forward? I think you more or less articulated the epistemology I'm defending well. So do you see a contradiction? Uh, well, wh wh which part of what I said articulate that? Because I wouldn't say I see a contradiction more so as I'm not quite sure how you see Well, you said there's a mixture together. of internalism and externalism. Oh, right. Does that create a contradiction yeah. or is that just a, a, a broad epistemology or... Oh, well, I, I, I'm reluctant to use the word contradiction because, uh, I mean, that seems to be a fairly precise statement that you're, you're holding a proposition and, uh, and its negation, which is pretty hard to show. Um, so I would just say that it seems it's not obvious to me how you would reconcile those two aspects. Now, what I say it's not obvious, I don't mean by that that like one can't do it. Um, I'm no expert. I'm just speaking on the basis of what I understand, right? And I'm sure people have tried to do this. Um, and I, I mean, personally, I do think that there's something to reliableism. I just personally don't think that it is um, that like the main part of an answer. So, yeah, no, I don't say, I, I wouldn't say I see a contradiction. I just am sort of curious to see how those relate to each other. In particular, uh, maybe where I push further is to ask, like, when I, when I ask a question, like, how, when is this, how is this person justified in believing X? And maybe X is particularly going to be something like relating to religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, particularly, because that's where we're going to differ most, I think. Um, I, I think I'm going to want to know whether you're going to appeal to other beliefs or whether you're going to appeal to a, a cognitive or, or some other type of process and and that seems to be your answer to that would seem to you're going to tease apart whether you're leading to the more reliableist like externalist or more the internalist direction but again maybe you can tell the story that sort of involves both of those i'm not sure right i mean the typical you know the epistemology within our tradition maybe i can just talk more specifically about how it's actually stated and presented to, you know so a sure. newcomer will be told you know so, there'll be some element of you know suspend your disbelief you know just try to understand it you know as a coherent picture and actually understand what's being stated get your head around it uh it's not we're not saying believe it we're just saying you know entertain the thought and you know, and try some of the lifestyle on, you know, chant Hare Krishna a little bit, you know, go vegetarian for a while, see, see how it affects your consciousness. And like, it's common, someone will chant, start chanting Hare Krishna. And after a month of chanting Hare Krishna, they, they can no longer bring themselves to eat meat because their consciousness has changed. And they just see meat as a kind of violence that they don't want to be implicated in. So it's stated, you know, in our teachings that meat is violence and you don't want to be implicated in. And then you chant Hare Krishna and you start to see it firsthand. So it's no longer, you know, even if you were never told that by the book, you've just got this internal conviction about the, the violence involved with meat and how you, you can't, cons your conscience can't stomach that. And uh, other points of the epistemology would be, you know, like in Bhagavad Gita, it says, you know, uh, not only, you know, like Krishna is, is, you know, God who's descended to, you know, reinvigorate the religious teachings. And uh, he says, uh, Arjuna says to him at one point, you know, not just do, you know, not, not only am I saying you're God, all these other authorities for the past. So it's quite common that a statement will be supported by quoting, uh, spiritual authorities so these are people who are on a an exalted platform and uh, so these people who are god realized 
they're considered to be authorities on the spiritual subject matter. So that's one element. And, you know, if you apply the epistemology to them, well, how do they know? And Bhagavad Gita says the self-realized souls can impart knowledge onto you because they've seen the truth. So there's a certain stage of spiritual realization where you, it's no longer theoretical. It becomes, uh, there's a term, uh, gyan, and then vigyan. So gyan means knowledge and vigyan means realized knowledge. Uh, one analogy I gave for it recently was, uh, you know, if, if you have a textbook on how to perform heart surgery, you don't really know how to perform heart surgery. But if you've actually performed heart surgery successfully, now you know how to perform heart surgery. So in a similar way, you know, you, you, you understand, oh, yeah, hypothetically, I get it. The animals are suffering, but, you know, I just enjoy eating meat. But then you chant Hare Krishna and your consciousness becomes purified and then you actually cannot bring yourself to eat meat because you directly see the violence involved. I'm not... I'm not trying to hammer on anyone who's immediately here. I'm just using this as an example. Um, let's see another point. Oh, yeah, there's a verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is one of our core scriptures, that states that uh, just as somebody who's engaged in the process of eating experiences three things simultaneously, uh, they experience pleasure, they get nourishment, they get energy, and their hunger goes away. Tushi, pushi, chudapaya. Chudapaya means for your hunger goes away. Uh, Tushji means pleasure and pushji means you get nourishment. And in the same way, someone who's engaged in the process of bhakti yoga and coming closer to God, they experience three things simultaneously. They get detachment from the material world. So, you know, a holy person should not be keeping up with the Joneses. They should be self-satisfied and not, you know, interested in, you know, oh, you know, I got the latest smartphone, but they just released a new one and it's slightly better. You know, mommy, can I have it? A saintly person is not interested in that kind of thing. They're, they're getting their satisfaction from something deeper. And so they get detachment. They get direct perception of the absolute truth of God. And they, they experience bhakti. Bhakti means devotion or, or you know, like a, a feeling of, of love for God and a desire to serve God. Um, so it, it's, it's very much described that at the higher levels of realization, it's something that you actually perceive firsthand. And the analogy is, again, to, to eating a food. So to eating food. So when you eat a, eat a good meal, you, you don't require a certificate from a doctor to tell you that you've eaten a good meal and, you know, experienced pleasure and get gotten nourishment and your hunger has gone away. You know self-evidently that you've eaten a satisfying meal. This, yeah, this notion of self-evidence might be worth talking about further, especially because you said there that, uh, people who reach a certain level of spiritual accomplishment can, I think you said, directly perceive God or something similar to that. What was the language you used? Uh, yeah, well, the Bhagavatam describes they get direct perception of the absolute truth. That's uh, bhakti prash anubhava vrakti. So, direct perception of absolute truth. I'll pull up the verse. Yeah, so that means direct perception of God. So, yeah. I mean, people would ask Prabhupada, who's the founder of the Hare Krishna movement in the West, you know, have you seen God? And he'd answer it different ways at different times. Sometimes he'd just say, there's the deity, right? So we've got, you know, the, the, the Sanskrit words murti, but, you know, really we're, we're talking about statues, but we don't like the word statue because it assumes dull matter. We're, we're talking about God who's appeared in the form of a stone or brass or wood. And uh, he, so he sometimes he'd say, there's the deity. You can all look and see the deity. Obviously, that's not quite the same thing for a non-believer as seeing God. But then, you know, like Arjuna and Bhagavad Gita, you know, ask, show me your universal form. And it's described in the purport that Krishna showed his universal form as a way for future people that claim to be incarnations of God that we can debunk them. You know, we can say, show me your universal form if you're God. So Krishna had to give Arjuna spiritual eyes to show him this. And then he showed him, you know, this universal form and, uh, so that there's a, a, a kind of direct contact with something special, but you know, for the normal devotee, like, you know, I, I don't really know to what extent, you know, the average, you know, advanced devotee and the Hare Krishna movement is, you know, if, I mean, you get people saying they talk to God and you get people saying, you know, they've been in front of the deity and had like strong emotions and a strong sense that, you know, God was smiling at them or, you know, not happy with them or, there can be different emotions, but people will. So, I mean, obviously you'll have a different explanation for this kind of thing, but the, I'm just giving you the, the perspective of from our epistemology. So yeah, you, you can comment. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just trying to think about this notion of um, 
direct perception of truth and relating that to what you were saying about um, self-evidence and so forth. Uh, see, I don't think, I don't really think I buy into that as, uh, as a uh, uh, as a good description of how knowledge is justified, basically. So uh, let me try to articulate that. So it, it, it seems to me that, okay, let, let's suppose that um, I had an experience where it seemed to me that God appeared to me and told me a bunch of stuff. Um, some, th you know, he, he gave me a bunch of theological knowledge, and I, I believe that I had direct perception of of that truth. Right. So, I, I guess the one way we could say that is that I'd had direct access to that absolute truth. But to me, it would seem like that I could still doubt what I experienced, right? Because I could think, well, are there any other explanations that I could have for the particular experiences that I've gone through? And and if there's sort of any other way, even a fairly, um, you know, outlandish way, really, uh, that um, I can explain that, then at least there are, then at the very least, there's a possibility of doubt there as to whether my uh, original sort of understanding of what happened was correct. Now, you can still have knowledge even without certainty, but the point I want to make here is that if you can have a level of doubt, then what, how do we know that you maybe can't have a lot of doubt like how can we establish that we can be confident our original attribution or maybe understanding of what we experienced is the correct one um and, and the way i would articulate that as sort of someone who leans towards coherentism is something along the lines of what we need to do is fit any experience we have into the existing framework of our worldview or just our set of beliefs um, and see how well that overall sort of coheres and fits with itself uh, which of course includes all of our experience and memories and so forth. Um, and, we, and we try to find a worldview, a set of beliefs that has sort of the best fit. So we, we look at explanatory uh, virtues and simplicity as well. Um, and doing that, then I, basically I would use that to assess any experience that I had. Um, but it seems to me it would be premature for me to just assert in response to any experience that I had, that I had just sort of directly perceived the, the truth of the matter there, because that just, it, it, to me, seems to be jumping the gun a bit in terms of uh, assuming that there's sort of no other way to understand what I've experienced other than that it directly corresponds to what's happened. Does that make sense? So how do you, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm welcome to these kind of objections, but the, how I would deal with them is to see what they do for competing worldviews. So what happens when we apply that to the existence of other minds to the existence of the external world in other words what do you what do you do with solipsism on that epistemology how, how do you know that there is a real world outside your mind right well i mean i think first and foremost it, it seems that if we say that um we sort of directly perceive the external world then we can't even make sense of these skeptical questions and to me the, the questions are sensible questions um and so already off the bat i feel like if we feel like we're just saying we directly perceive things we, we can't even understand how someone could ask the question um but, i do find those well, skeptical questions to be quite odd personally well there's a difference between finding them personally odd and thinking that they're just sort of uh incoherent or, or not even asking something meaningful right because if everyone just directly perceives the world as it is then why would even anyone even ask the question about like could we be brains and vats or, you know, solve them, solve them, be true. Like, because Western how, philosophers how does, are how weird. How do we form that idea, right? Western philosophers are Sorry? Because Western philosophy is weird, that's why. Yeah, I don't know if that's limited to Western philosophy, but but we, we could get distracted by that discussion. Um, I'm not sure. I don't so, think solipsism came up in Eastern philosophy. Um, yeah, I mean, sort of asking how we can reasonably ask these I mean, I think what you're getting at there is sort of, you know, sort of how reliable... You know, like sort of degrees of reliability of our perceptions is kind of a separate question from the underlying epistemological framework. No, because I I wasn't saying anything about perception there. Well, I guess I sort of was. But what what you're saying, you were asking a question about solipsism, for example. How do we know the existence of other minds? Um, and and I didn't in my response. Well, it wasn't really a response. I was just sort of saying that it feels like a meaningful question at the very least. So an epistemology should be able to support that as a cogent question separate from 
our answer to that question. But but I didn't say anything specifically about a particular perception and how reliable it is. Uh, in terms of how I would answer the question of uh, the problem of other minds or skepticism in generally, uh, I mean, I, I think at a very broad brush level, it's going to be the same answer in any case. You, you, you take the phenomena in question and um, compare different beliefs uh, it, with respect to the different answers to that question and see how well they form a coherent worldview. Um, so one view, um, well, let me phrase that differently. So suppose we're solipsists, right? Uh, we believe that we're the only personal mind that exists and then all other uh, people are just, I don't know, part of our mind or our imagination or a dream or whatever exactly we want to call it. Um, well, then we have to ask the question like, well, well, how does all their behavior, where do all their behavior sort of come from? Um, and how do we account for all of the perceptions and interactions we have with them? Um, and to, to me, at least from my studies, I, I haven't found an explanation that really makes a lot of sense of that. Um, like in your discussion with Graham Mulpey, he was, I'm pretty sure it was your discussion with him. Yeah, he did mention I'm something. I'm mixing it. It, it. You know, if you go full solipsist and uh, couple that with idealism especially, then it, it doesn't seem like we can give much of an explanation about why our perceptions are the way they are, because it seems like they could be anyway. Um, and, and everything is just sort of unexplained, it seems to me. Whereas under a realist view, we, and, and that coupled with a bunch of beliefs about science and how the world works and so forth, that, that I'll appeal to as part of that, um, we have actually a lot of regularities and law-like behaviors that we can appeal to to explain, well, this is why our perceptions are the way they are, and this is why we experience these sort of things, this is why people re respond in certain ways. So I feel like that coheres a lot better, that provides a better explanation of the sort of body of our beliefs uh, that fit together better than uh, than a solipsist idealist view. So so at a, at, a, at a high level, that's basically what I'm going to say whenever you ask, like, why do you believe this thing? I'm going to say, well, I, I feel like it's a better overall fit, essentially. Yeah, yeah, that is kind of similar to the explanation Graham Oppie gave. Um, I, was, I wasn't familiar with it, so I don't have much pushback for it. Uh, I mean, we can modify the, the solipsist argument a little bit, and I can't remember the, what the thought experiment's called where there's a... A, a virtual reality machine that you can enter into and you can program it before you enter it to, to have, you know, all the right parameters that you want. And then when you enter, enter it, you'll basically have your dream reality. The only difference is you'll be the only person there. So you won't be interacting with real people and it won't be a real world. It'll be one that you programmed and chose to enter. So obviously you could kind of discount that because you could you pr presumably you wouldn't program the reality to be quite the way it is now you know we th there's various you know we might program it with a bigger bank account for ourselves and a little bit less child poverty and yeah and so on. well that's right i mean but, so let, let's suppose we might not be the programmers though right let, maybe someone else is someone else is programming it and they just decided you know like maybe a matrix scenario they're just like well we want to make all these humans batteries in a machine and we need them to be docile. So we've got to give them a reality that's along the lines of what they're expecting. So we end up with this world very similar to the one we used to be in. Only difference is nothing about it is real. And with the advances in technology, it's becoming more and more uh, conceivable how such a simulation could be created. I'm not expert on all of those details, but I know they're coming a long way in, with virtual reality simulation. Well, you were asking before we... Um before we started about my upcoming debate with uh, inspiring philosophy. And, and he believes that we, we do live in a simulation, but this it's in a simulation in the mind of God, which I find an interesting view. But anyway, so yeah, there are people who think we live in a simulation, not all theists. But I mean, from my point of view, again, uh, so empirically, it, it could well be that we have no experiences that would differ between those two situations. So I think, again, a skeptical question about do we live in a simulation or are we brains and bats? makes sense it's a cogent enough question um my answer to it again would just be that well that explanation i think is inferior because it seems that internal to the simulation all of the laws uh, seem, are going to operate in the same way like whether our reality is the base reality or is, is simulated in a different base reality um the difference will be that one view postulates an, a bunch of extra stuff that is the other view doesn't so basically one view is simpler than the other and that's why i mean i think that that is the best answer to these sort of skeptical questions is that absent a particular reason to postulate a simulator or a simulation or uh, uh, other layers of other layers of reality um then i think that it's a, a simpler explanation is just to assume that we live in the base reality well i shouldn't say assume it's not an assumption it, it's 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 a postulate that better explains the data um and i think that we should accept the postulates or set of beliefs that best explain 
our, our other beliefs. Like they all, they all fit together, right? Now, I, I just want to clarify something here. There, there is an issue here in the way that I sometimes talk about this, because the way I tend to think about it is like you've got your data and then you, you, you fit different like curves through it as if you're doing statistics or something. Um, and then that's the model that you believe that sort of best fits the data and you have to trade off fit with complexity. Um, and, you know, there's things to be said about how to do that exactly. One problem that I think that where that doesn't fit exactly with epistemology is uh, what, what's sometimes called the problem of the given. So when we're doing like statistics, you start with data, which you just take as like given. It's it's certain for the purpose of your analysis. And then you try to fit a model to it. Well, when we're doing epistemology, certainly as a coherentist, at least, you can't take anything as certain, right? Because everything is just another belief, right? So, um, I mean, there's some people who try to say, like, there's an idea of called sense data theory, where it's like you try to take particular percepts as certain, but there's issues with that because perception is theory laden. And so you, you kind of can't even have perception independently of your existing belief. So I'm just sort of bracketing this as there's complexities here because it's not clear what the data is when we're talking in these terms. Because again, the way that data is treated statistically, like it's treated as certain and you don't have to question it. You just, you know, model the data. But when we actually, you know, are doing epistemology, you can potentially question everything. And so it's about, um, it's, I think of it as a recursive process that you like, t you know, take the things that you think you believe, uh, the, th the things that you think you believe as fixed, try to fit a model to that, um, and then see how well that um, model would sort of be predicted by, you know, the beliefs that you have. And then maybe that certain beliefs will, will stand as outliers there. And you say, well, given what I've just thought of, I'm now going to doubt this belief. And then you sort of repeat the process. So anyway, um, it, so it's a bit messy, but I still think that this idea of sort of trying to find the best fit of, of our set of beliefs to, to the things that we observe and, and things that we believe it m makes more sense than trying to find a starting point and then build everything off that. So maybe I, I can ask you a question. Do, do you think that that's how we do or should go about justifying our beliefs, like with a starting point that we then inf build from? Well, we yeah, we, we definitely have to start somewhere. I, I would call that foundationalism. So we... we I mean, I, I explained it with the, the in the OPI discussion that, you know, we have, you know, even the idea of debunking assumes foundationalism, I argue, or self-evident or in, in, intuitional foundationalism, whatever you want to call it. I'm, I haven't arrived at, at terms for all this yet. And I kind of throw around lots of terms and just to explain what I mean by them. Um, so even the idea of debunking assumes that we have self-evident foundations because the idea that you could prove something wrong means, you know, something else is true. And how can you know something else is true unless you have self -evident, a self-evident foundation for knowing that? So my objection to coherentism, you know, I think the description you gave of solving solipsism, I think it's, it's fair enough. It's a simpler explanation. But then we can pu uh, push the question back further because, you know, I would say we know there's a real world outside our mind and other people exist because of the self-evident nature. So when I wake up from a dream, the quality of my experience is such that I know this is more real than the dream. And some people, when they have out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences, report that their experience <clears throat> where they were at, when they were out of their body was more real than their waking experience. Their thoughts were faster. They could see colors that don't exist in this world. And they could see in 360-degree uh, vision and so on. Uh, where, where is it? Uh, so that that's it's hypothetically possible that we wake up from this life to a more real world so the, the point here is about the quality of our experience so we we have different memories and some memories are false we can remember things you know we are some memories are reliable and some memories aren't and the one of the ways we distinguish between memories is because of the the quality of the memory or the, the resolution so if, if memory is foggy it's like ah. Oh, you know, I think I had this for breakfast, you know, Tuesday last week, but I can't really remember it. But it's like, you know, what happened the day my son was born or, you know, there's certain things that we remember vivid details of. And it's like, no, that's what I remember. I, I know that's for a fact. Is, and um, we, we need to distinguish things like that. So coming back to uh, the coherentism view is, is that you're, you then gave sort of, logical reasons like you know it's simpler and a simpler explanation is, has more cognitive virtues 
So we, we prefer a theory that's simpler, provided it has equal or greater explanatory value. So then the question I can ask is, you know, while I agree with that principle, how do we know that that principle gives us knowledge? We, we, all we can do is take that as self-evident. Oh, no, I don't agree with that at all. So we, uh, that is what I don't agree with is that we need to just take that as self-evident. Um, yeah, so so that would be more of a foundationalist view, right? You're going to push down to a set of beliefs that you take as, as evident um, and don't require further justification. But but as a coherentist, I'm generally going to deny that. I, again, I, I don't want to say that I'm 100% a coherentist, but again, I lean towards that. So I'll defend that for the purpose of this conversation. Um, well, no, again, again, so how would I just fight? Well, it you know, fits with my other beliefs, right? But so let me then um, unpack that a little bit. So the way I think about why a more parsimonious explanation is superior is basically because it, I mean, there's different ways to articulate this, but it makes fewer claims on reality. So if you just think about it in terms of probability, um, the, f the fewer independent claims you make, the more likely uh, the, the conjunct is to be true. The, the more you add strictly well, it's at least a weekly, um, going to be less likely. Um, and so although the analogy is not perfect, you like to formally show that, you know, you have to make these various assumptions about the nature of reality. And if reality is infinite, then how do you define the probability space, blah, blah, blah. But the, the point is, I broadly think of it in those terms that the more things you're saying, um, the smaller possibility space you're referring to, and then it, it's less likely that all of those things you've specified are going to pertain or going to be the case. So when we have a more complex theory or explanation, uh, we're constraining reality, so to speak, uh, more than a less complex one. And so I, I think that there's a broad principle there that um, w we can understand that fits with our other sets of beliefs about, you know, how we reason um, that makes sense. And, and if you then ask me, well, you know, how do we know about the probability stuff or how do we know about like the possibility space thing? Well, well, then I'll just start talking about that and point to other reasons I have for thinking that those are good um, approaches to take and then how they've been successful here and there. Right. And for me, it all fits together and links together in a, in a, in a belief system. There's no foundational point that I have to start with and then not subject to doubt or, or doesn't have to be justified because I think everything can be subjected to doubt and should be, and everything in principle requires justification. Uh, we've got this this comment which I, uh, touches on a, a good objection that the coherence theory of justification can hardly show that coherentism, that the co coherentist justification is truth conducive. I don't understand why. Why can't it? So, what, what, what's the? I don't understand the, the objection. The problem is that you're. It's basic. It could just all be floating in the ether. So you have a bunch of view. You know, like a Harry Potter world. You 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 could. You could, you know, read the Harry Potter novels and construct for yourself a worldview which is fully consistent with itself, but it's got all these things in there. So, I mean, obviously, you'll probably object to the Harry Potter objection by talking about how it's grounded in our experience and observation and you know, repeatability and so on. Um, but still, if all of your justification for observation and just, you know, and our theories built on that and probabilities and repetition is circular in nature, because it, it seems to be that the, the coherentism kind of just goes round in a circle. Then um, how do we know it's not just all floating up in the ether and isn't actually grounded to reality? Yeah, well, this is a classic objection to coherentism. Um, I think, uh, I, I think in a sense, this actually, this objection, at least to me, um, at least to me shows that coherentism is kind of on the right track because it, it seems that anyone who actually lives in our world is going to have a whole set of experiences that that tie them to the same reality like someone who reads the harry potter books obsessively might have i don't know dreams or delusions that they live in a harry potter world and magic is is work uh, works right but that they're still going to have learned to read in the same world that we inhabit and walk around and eat and all of that stuff right and that that that's going to put a whole bunch of um beliefs in their set of beliefs that they then have to reconcile with their other beliefs right so now you could imagine okay so let, let's then imagine a thought experiment where actually the person doesn't grow up in our world and like somehow grows up in a fantasy world where it's like all of their perceptions are coherent uh, oh, sorry i shouldn't use the word coherent all of their perceptions fit with what they would be if harry potter world was true right but but then it would seem to me that actually it would make perfect sense that they would be justified in believing the harry potter world was true if everything that they'd experienced was consistent with that. So I don't, I don't actually see, so, so this only seems to make sense to me if we think that like 
someone who grows up with a completely different set of experiences, and by that I mean like from birth upwards and experience in a very general sense, sh should come to, sh would be justified in believing the same things that we would be justified in believing in, in the world that we've grown up in. But that actually seems wrong to me because they would have a very different set of um, uh, beliefs that, and experiences they're trying to fit together. So I guess we need to point out the difference between um, an epistemology being rational and an epistemology being truth tracking. So, you know, somebody could be in a position where they're, they're fully rational in the beliefs they hold, but their, their beliefs are false. Um, and I don't see how coherentism can establish that it's truth tracking as opposed to just rational. Right. Well, coherentism is not a th well. Th that's a good point in a sense because coherentism is a theory of epistemic justification. It's not a theory of establishing truth. So, uh, asking how a theory of justification proves that your beliefs are true, I think, is is sort of asking the wrong question. You see, because I can say the same thing about foundationalism. I can say, well, how do you know you've picked the right foundation? And and it's the same question as to how do you know that the, the foundation that you start with relates to or corresponds to things in reality because if you pick the wrong one then all of your other beliefs are going to be out of whack this this kind of relates to um nathan digital gnosis's comment he keeps posting it so i better bring it on the screen can someone think they had a higher quality experience and be mistaken so i should move this well i actually wanted to ask about this um i don't want to derail nathan's question too much but uh, maybe if i can make this a bit more specific at i think what he's getting at because i i think that you're the um epistemology you articulated about um how we i'm just trying to remember exactly what you said before uh, about how we come to know things uh has as issues so you said that we um that's right yeah so so when we um when we perceive something or at least you know under a broad set of conditions we have um yeah that's right you're talking about the difference in dreams and waking up yeah th this is what i was, had in mind so you say that we can sort of tell it's evident to us that there's a qualitative difference between the nature of the experience we had when we we're asleep and when we we're awake and by that it's sort of just evident to us that we apprehend the real world uh when we're awake um at least you know under a normal set of circumstances let's say so what i want to ask here is that sorry uh so a uh, digital gnosis is calling himself a troll because i pointed out that he kept kept putting the same question in the comments so he's calling himself a <laughs> well maybe just really wants to know the answer well so what i want to what I want to ask about that is, um, it seems to me, if I was to say something like, uh, I know that there's a tree there because I perceive a tree there, or it's evident to me that there's a tree there, maybe you prefer that language, um, that, that doesn't really follow unless we make an additional presumption that if I perceive a tree there, then at least probably there's a tree there, right? So we need to, con we need to conjoin that um, proposition with the um, I perceive a tree or it is evident to me there's a tree there to to infer the belief that there is a tree there. So th the question I think um, would be something like, a a how do you get the proposition that if it is evident to me that there's a tree there, then there really is a tree there? Okay, how, is Because I don't see how that could, could be just evident. Because I, I see how you might say our perception of the tree can be evident because there's a, a notion of our access to our perceptions, right? But the notion that if there's a tree there, sorry, if it is evident that there is a tree there, then there is one. Do you think that that also is evident to us? Because it's not, I'm, I don't see how it could be. I, I, I see where you're going. It, it's, it springs up a good point. Um, I was discussing this uh, recently on Facebook and someone was saying that um, epistemology, oh no, this was, yeah, it was, it was a, gentleman I was, a devotee I was speaking to on on a call online, he was saying that uh, epistemology is, you can't separate it from ontology. So an epistemology is inextricably linked to a particular worldview. So like the, yeah. the, the Western kind of skepticism makes sense in a particular framework of how the world is, is viewed. And because in the East, they, they viewed the world differently. That's different. Those questions didn't come up and different questions came up. Um, well, so they had different assumptions, but I guess that's kind of tied into the same thing. So the, the proposition which, which you have tied into the self-evident epistemology, which I'm defending, would be that experience is uh, qualitatively unique 
I don't have a, I don't know if I have a good catchy phrase for this yet, but I, the, the phrase qualitatively unique describes it. So, uh, so when, when you have a dream, you know, the, the dreams are kind of wacky, like they're, they're odd, you know, when you wake up and you think back on a dream that they're kind of illogical, but when you're in the dream, you don't question it. It's just kind of your reality and you're there. But, you know, you don't remember your waking life while you're in a dream and think this dream's more real than my waking life. But when you wake up, you can remember your dream and think, oh, that, yeah, that's just a dream. This is real life because there's a, a qualitative difference. So the proposition is that the, the quality of an experience is directly connected to the thing that, to the object of the experience. So the object would be the, the thing out there which is triggering the experience. Like, or in the case of the dream, it might just be your, your, your brain or your subconscious mind triggering it all but you know when we wake up you know on, on most worldviews at least we we believe we're participating in a real world with other people in it and there's things out there that we interact with and uh so th there's a lot of statements and and arguments given for god's existence or for you know krishna being god where it's like you know krishna did this pastime he lifted Govardhan down hill at, as eight years old you know he he killed the demon putana as a small baby his there's so many pastimes he did and the, the claim is made that nobody else can do these things only god can do these things so if we see somebody today you know at eight years old, lifting up a hill to create an umbrella to shelter his village from, uh, you know, a thunderstorm, then we can assume this person's God because it's not possible for a, an ordinary soul or even a demigod to imitate these activities. So, yeah, um, qualitative uniqueness is, is the proposition that goes along with that. And then when you have that, then when you're appeared to truly, as, as the philosophical jargon goes, you, you can know that there's actually a tree there because of the quality of your experience. And uh, coming back to Nathan's question, you, you could think that you're being appeared to treely and actually be hallucinating or something. Uh, but there's ascending levels of realization. And when you're on a higher level of realization, you can no longer, you know, like if you're, you know, if you're on drugs, you, you can mistake things. But when you become sober, you look at those same things and you see them clearly, you know, you know well, I guess the hallucinations are gone, but uh, when you, when your consciousness becomes elevated, like it, there's a statement in Bhagavad Gita, Param Drishva Nivartate, you, you give up the lower thing by experiencing a higher thing. So epistemology, the same kind of principle plays out, but here the Bhagavad Gita is talking about um, taste or experience. So, you know, someone might have a gambling addiction or drug addiction or something. And the solution, you know, there's the 12 step programs and so much, so on, but well, I get people with trauma get drug addictions, but they're trying to hide, hide from their pain. But if, if, you, if you're not in pain and you're actually experiencing something higher, then why would you go and take drugs? You know, drugs are what people do when they're trying to escape from their life. But if, you know, like they did that experiment with mice where they gave them uh, a really boring cage and they had two water bottles, two drippers, and one had heroin and one had, had water. And if the mice were bored, they'd just take the heroin. But if they create like a mouse theme park and there's everything a good little mice need, mouse needs to be happy, then the mice don't take the heroin. They just drink the water. So that, this is the point about higher taste. So I, I'm applying the same principle to epistemology that when you get this deeper realization, then the, the mistaken real, realizations you had before where you thought you, you knew something, but you didn't, those fall away. And, you know, you could apply a little bit of, you know, this kind of entails a little bit of intellectual humility or epistemic humility where, you know, I've got these realizations. I know these things to be true. It's possible there's something deeper or, you know, some uh, way that, you know, I'm a little bit mistaken, but I know I'm going in the right direction and that there's some degree of truth to these things. So, if you you want to say something well actually there are interesting questions raised by that but uh, but i want to come back to to this issue that i think um would it plagues the way you've articulated the notion of justification because let's say we we ap appeal to this notion of the quality of our experience right and we say something like it is evident to me that there is a tree over there um and we also say that it is evident to me that this experience of there being a tree there has such and such a quality. It still seems to me that we need the premise that when uh, perceptions uh, or things that are evident to me have such and such a quality, then they are veridical or, you know, or in the specific case, when I perceive a tree with a perception being in such and such a quality, then there is a tree there. 
and I, I, I'd still would like to question how we justify that second premise there, if you want to call it a premise. Uh, so, uh, sorry. How do we know that when we experience things with such and such a quality, you know, this, this high level of awareness or what, however you phrased it, how do we know that that type of experience relates to reality? Or, wow. or gives rise to um, beliefs that are corresponding to reality? Where, where does that, like, is that, it does that belief itself, is that belief itself evident to us? So, I mean, the way I'd respond to that, I mean, I, I would say that's self-evident. Obviously, it's not self-evident to everybody because some people doubt it, but that's where we bring in virtue epistemology and just say, you know, depending on someone's epistemic virtues or, you know, their whatever cognitive biases they have or the, the level of consciousness they're on, they'll, they'll perceive these things differently. Um, but the other thing I would say to it is even if you want to doubt that, I don't think it hurts the epistemology at all. All it does is uh, change the degree of certainty which is attributed to any conclusions that are produced. And it does that consistently across the board to any conclusion. So anything you do to an epistemology that only changes the certainty of the conclusions but does it equally to every conclusion doesn't really affect the epistemology much because you're still going to arrive at the same conclusions. It's just instead of saying, you know, I know with complete certainty gods exist, you're just going to say God existing is the best conclusion I've come to. And I could be wrong, but I've, I've got, it's the best conclusion I've got. So two thoughts there. One, well, I guess three thoughts. The first is that I think that you get into a regress problem with this because then you, like if you were to say, well, yes, I think it is evident that the second premise is true. But then I ask, well, how do you know that? Is that evident? And we can keep going with what, whatever higher level you want to appeal to. I can ask, is that evident? And I think that it's less plausible you should go down that regress. Maybe you can avoid a regress there, but I do have a regress concern. Second thought is that um, when you talk about the fact that, well, it just reduces our beliefs by um, a sort of a, a set amount, uh, like the confidence of the beliefs, even if we don't take it a certain. I, I don't know that it makes sense to talk about something that is evident in a non-justified like a non uh, non-inferentially evident but not certain I, that doesn't really make sense to me because then how could it be evident if there's room for doubt again maybe you can make sense of that but it's not obviously making sense to me the third thought is that it doesn't follow that all of our beliefs will sort of just stay the way they are if everything's reduced across the board by a certain amount because if we get to belief in god or really anything else by a series of inferences and we have beliefs that are at least somewhat independent of each other and then we multiply out the probabilities what started off as as uh, certain deductions from an initial certain premise then might be 0.9 percent or 0.8 percent or whatever it is at each 0.8 percent no so 0.8 at each level so you get 0.8 times 0.8 or whatever it is and you might actually get to the end belief being significantly less than a 0.5 justification um, and, and so because of this chaining of inferences, I don't actually think, I think a little bit of uncertainty at the start can actually have a significant impact at the end point, depending on exactly the structure of the knowledge. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I, I'm not sure that the, the logical math would quite apply in that fashion. Like where, you know, the, the inferential steps, do they change in certainty too? Um, um, does my certainty that two plus two equals four now become questioned? So every time I have to do addition, I, I've now, you know, decreased my certainty. Well, that's going to depend on how you think that that sort of knowledge is justified. But but I, what I was talking about is, um, and it, well, the example I was referring to before with the tree example is a sort of a perceptual one. So if you, for example, think that, um, I mean, this may not be what you think, right? But just as an example, if you think that we can come to a knowledge of God based on uh, a series of experiences that we have, maybe in combination with some um, intellectual arguments or whatever then um if we if there's any sort of cumulative effect that those have then you're going to have to multiply out the probabilities or at least the conditional probabilities um and and potentially then the the final um probability is is going to decrease um well actually it it can't increase it it will almost certainly decrease uh but but you also raise the point that well maybe some a sort of a probabilistic uh, rules of probability don't apply here um i mean that that could be the case some sort of you know, making assumptions by talking about that. Though, though I would say that if we're going to throw out the axioms of probability with respect to, or like epistemic probability, I guess, thinking about, um, you know, the likelihood of our beliefs, then uh, it seems you're going to lose a lot um, in in our ability to 
uh, articulate levels of confidence and and other things. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussions to be had there because, yeah, th there are assumptions you need to make in applying probability to these to these notions. But you see, even if you replace it with something else, it's you, you may still face similar problems. It's sort of de it's just going to depend on how because it because you said before that well we reduce our confidence in everything across the board and then so it doesn't have an effect but i'm not sure that it does apply if you're using a standard probability it definitely doesn't apply maybe you're using some other notion of like plausibility or, or degree of certainty or something that doesn't follow the normal rules of probability and there are uh, proposals to that but um so I, I yeah i guess it's going to depend on the specifics there but um yeah i mean that's that's a difficult question because people get, people have different views on what the appropriate notion is to to apply to this. And the same goes with coherentism as well, by the way, because people have different explanations to like exactly what does it mean for beliefs to cohere. And I don't necessarily have a set view on that. Right. Yeah. I'd like to see the uh, argument fleshed out a bit as to how the logical math would apply where a, a degree of certainty when multiplied ends in less and less certainty as you get further down the inference chain. Maybe maybe now's not the time, but I don't know if you have a, a quick example of that. Well, uh, well, it, the, the quick example is, is just a f just the fact that probabilities are always less than one. Well, they can be equal to one, but they're less than or equal to one. And so when you multiply them out, um, the number gets smaller. So whenever you have a combination of claims that all have a probability of less than one, and you multiply them out. Um, as long as their conditional probability, as long as the, all the conditional probabilities on the chain are less than one, um, which seems to be implied by the fact that you like don't have full c maximal confidence in any of them, then the more steps you have in your inference, the lower your probability is at the end of the chain. So let's say I'm I'm filing my taxes and I'm I'm eighty percent sure that I earn this much, and I'm eighty percent sure that this bit of income goes in this box and this bit of income goes in that box and I'm 80% sure that I get taxed at this rate, then whatever the math would be, it would be 80% times 80% times 80%. So we might end up with like 40% or something. Maybe someone's good at math. <laughs> yeah, if those are all independent beliefs, then that's that would be the case, yes. So, I mean, I don't see how the same... So point out cubed is about 50%, yeah. So you see how it can diminish quite quickly. So how does your view, you know, let's say... Because, I, you know, let's say that the skepticism is, applies equally across the board and I'm trying to file my taxes. So every step of inference and every piece of data, I'm 80% sure of because we've introduced a bit of skepticism. So when I go to file my taxes, I might only be 5% sure that I'm doing it right. And there's big fines for doing it wrong. So, you know, <laughs> who, who's going to feel good filing their taxes yeah. if that's the way we look at things. But so I don't see well, how I think it, is, world... it is the way we should look at things because we, we can make, we, we have to think about the way errors can compound. So I think that this is sort of correct to be concerned about this. One thing I would say is that, as I sort of mentioned before, broadly, this is a problem for, I think, any... Well, the, the reason I mentioned it is because you, you said earlier that if everything is reduced across the board in confidence, that doesn't matter. But I just don't think that's true. But I'm not saying that this issue of probabilities diminishing when we you know, multiply out things is not relevant for other worldviews. It is. One thing I would say is that the coherentist doesn't actually... Well, it's generally not going to say that most of our knowledge is justified through a deductive sort of relationship or a probabilistic relationship between like um, we, we start with one set of one like belief and then you infer another from it and then infer another from that because that's a, like a linear justification. For the most part, the current is going to say that beliefs are justified by the relationship that they or, or the role that they fulfill in a web of beliefs. Um, and so I think to fully assess that, you're going to have to assess the full um set of conditional probabilities and evidential relationships in the web of beliefs, which obviously is very hard to do because we have lots of beliefs, right? Um, but I mean, so you still could have these issues of, you know, compounding probabilities diminishing. It, it's just that b because of the structure of it, I, I think that well, it's, it's yeah, it's just not as clear what, what the end result is going to be. And the reason I think it can be an issue for a foundationalist is, is if the justification is supposed to be linear, that it's supposed to go from um, a starting point to an end point. Now, now, if if you the thing is, if you start with a foundational belief which is held to as certain, like as evident, and which I think would imply certain, and then you logically deduce beliefs from that in a chain, and um, so logic is truth. Well, valid logical inferences are truth preserving, right? So you're gonna you start with certainty, you make certain inferences, you you get to certainty as a result, right? 
Uh, not not saying that the foundationalist has to believe this about every belief, right? But with respect to the sort of things that you were talking about, where we directly perceive something that's evident to us, it would just seem to me that if we start with certainty there and then make inferences from it, we're going to end up with certainty at the end. But if each step is then um, subject to th this certain amount of, um, of error or, or uncertainty, then you're going to have a diminishing effect each step. Does, um, do you understand how this comment applies? The probability. Uh, I can't. Can you move it up? I can't see all of it. Oh, is it cutting off? Probably connections do not apply when it comes to truth. Propositions that are related into chain. Uh, the only sense I can make from that is if he means that probability connections don't apply because of the conditional probabilities being different from the um, unconditional ones. And that's true. That's why I did mention conditional probabilities a few times. But unless you think that everything is like, because if they're conditionally dependent mm -hmm. at the probability is one, then then you're not going to have any diminishment. But I'm not, like, as long as there's some independence between the propositions, like they're independent to some extent, which probably they're going to be. If Because what I'm talking about here is uh, imagine that you have a set of different experiences that relate to perceiving God or some spiritual truth. Uh, and maybe there's some inference, uh, like uh, logical or intellectual reasons as well. It just seems to me that those are going to be to some extent independent, um, that they're not going to be 100% like um, dependent on each other. And therefore the conditional probabilities aren't all going to be one. And therefore you're going to have a diminishment effect there. That digital analysis explaining it for dependent propositions, it would be the general conjunction rule. For independent propositions, it would be conjunctive. Yeah, I, I didn't necessarily want to spend too long talking about this. It was just one thought right, that I had um, in response to that notion of. I, I think the bigger issue is is the. Re, I think the bigger issue is actually the regress issue that I mentioned, or the potential for regress, yeah. um, and also this idea that we can have like a non-certain something could be evident to us but not certain i just i don't quite know how that makes sense well i i take them to be certain the the points i made about how you would respond to someone who's skeptical of those things are just sort of rhetorical arguments that you can offer to show you know even on your view it's always good in debate to work with the premises that the other person or, already accepts graham up his view yeah, in debate is if if somebody doesn't accept your premises then they just escape your argument so if you can work with the premises somebody already accepts, then you 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 have a powerful argument. So I I take the self-evident you know experiences we have that the the self-evident truths to be certain, and you know like d digital gnosis is question of oh could could you be wrong you know like one analogy that's given to answer that is the ripe the green mango point. So you could be eating green mangoes your whole life and think you're eating ripe mangoes. But the moment you have a ripe mango, you immediately know that all the other ones were green. And this is the first time you've tasted a ripe mango. Someone might say they like green, green mangoes and that would be another thing. But the, the analogy does its job, even if somebody happens to be weird. And yeah, like so I, I don't actually think the analogy does work, right? So I, I, I tend not to like these analogies maybe as much as you do because analogies are never perfect and, and maybe part of the argument that's most relevant is hiding in the analogy but but i think we can get somewhere here so suppose i've only had um non-ripe mangoes and then i have a mango that is um i mean maybe we have to make an assumption here about the structure of ripeness so Im imagine that uh, mangoes get more and more ripe and then they reach a like a point of maximum perfect ripeness that they only maintain for i don't know a minute or something and then if you go past that they just get slightly too overripe right but just hypothetically right um now suppose that i've been eating terribly unripe mangoes that are not even close to ripening right and then i and then i eat a mango one day that is more ripe but still not that maximum pinnacle of ripeness now now maybe i think this is it like this is the pinnacle of ripeness mango that, that i've just found here but i'd be wrong actually because it's just more ripe than the previous ones and in fact i could do this repeatedly i could i could get more and more ripe mangoes until I've sort of sampled the entire space of mango ripeness, or maybe had some other way of assessing it, I, I wouldn't actually have formed a true belief about mango ripeness. But you're getting closer. So it's truth tracking in the sense that it brings you closer to truth. And so I think this is consistent with our... So sampling, sampling from the space of uh, mango ripeness levels over a large period of time will allow you to assess... Um, mango ripeness yeah that's true but you see the what the, this is what i was saying i don't like these analogies because i think that the often the details hide in the analogies so i think once one simplifying factor here is that it's a single dimensional um if you had many more dimensions and the structure was slightly different you may actually never converge uh to, to the right answer depending on the sampling method you're using but uh, to, 
that's a bit abstract. So maybe I'll just point about, uh, make the point this way that um, you actually said originally that when you eat a ripe mango, you know it's evident to you, um, which you said you regard as certain that you've eaten a ripe mango. But I've just denied that by saying, uh, well, 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 actually, it's consistent that when you eat a ripe mango, you will know it. But you will also think that you've eaten a ripe mango when you eat any mango that's more ripe than the ones you've eaten before. So, so this raises the issue that um, the, the person in that circumstance can't actually tell whether they've truly eaten the pinnacle, the mango of the mango, the mango of pinnacle ripeness, or just a mango that is more ripe than the ones they'd eaten previously. So, I actually think you can't be certain in that situation unless you've sampled. Well, technically, you'd, you'd have to sample the entirety of the range of, of mangoes if you think it's continuous, right? You couldn't actually be certain that you'd had that that reached that pinnacle. Um, and so, I, I think that that is a problem if you think that you you need this certainty um which i think follows from saying that it's evident to us mm -hmm. otherwise we're making an inference based on like well the number of mangoes that i've sampled and my estimate of the distribution like that's an inference that's not evident right that's that's a different epistemology well the the response to that would be that um you're getting closer to the truth and that's all that matters so I didn't quite get what you're saying about adding dimensions, but in Krishna consciousness, there's a, an idea of ever increasing levels of realization. So, uh, love of God and spiritual realization, it always increases in quality. There's, there's never a point where it's like, like in Christian, uh, the eschatology or, you know, their, their idea of salvation, it's kind of binary. You're, you're either going to hell or you're going to heaven. You're either saved or you're not. But in Krishna consciousness, there's levels of advancement and it actually never ends. There's never a point where it's like, okay, this is it. And then nothing changes and it ceases to improve. It, and uh, it just, uh, the word, it reaches stasis. It never reaches a stasis. You're, you know, even uh, God is described, uh, he's always increasing in his glories. Um, and that the, the depth of his love with his devotees is always increasing. And that's also an argument for opulence that, you know, a, a God is the greatest being imaginable and greater than a God, which is in a state of stasis with regards to his opulence as a God whose perfection and opulence is always increasing. So, yeah. That's a very interesting idea, but I don't want to get distracted on that. Uh, but I, I, so I'm going to push back a bit here because I don't think that you can just say, well, we're getting closer to the truth, so that's what matters. I mean, I agree, getting closer to the truth is good, right? That And that's that's an important thing. But it's, I don't think it's sufficient to say that if we're trying to discuss epistemology and defend our views about how things are justified, because any worldview could say, as we gather more evidence, uh, we, we get closer to the truth. Like, I mean, any even semi-cogent epistemology is going to is going to have a way of saying that as we gather more evidence or more data or whatever, then we get closer to the truth. The question is how our beliefs are justified with respect to each other. And it seems to me that the mango analogy, and again, I, I know it's an analogy, so I don't want to push it too far, but I said, well, maybe we can get somewhere with it. The mango analogy doesn't really work as an articulation of how this notion of something being self-evident to us works, because you can't actually tell from eating a mango um, th that you've, you've actually tasted the maximally um, ripe mango. Um, that's not evident to you, uh, at least it seems to me, based on how I articulate it. And so an epistemology that is trying to be based on that sort of idea, uh, I, I think that, uh, at least as far as that analogy goes, it doesn't seem to work to me. Um, so what, what, what's the objection exactly? The objection is it's not evident to us that, uh, that once we've tasted the mango, that we've tasted the maximally ripe mango. Right. So you just have to remove this word maximally and just say that mango is more ripe than the ones we've eaten before. So just like, I, you know, I, I say that, okay. you know, when I but wake up from a dream, this yeah, is sorry, more, more real than my dream life. It's hypothetically, there's nothing, no reason to believe that I might not wake up from this life to an even more real reality. Okay. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. I don't know what it means to say more real, but putting that aside, the explanations that you gave previously, it, it, like go back, going back to the tree example, it seems that, you know, and again, correct me if I'm misrepresenting you, but it seems that you were saying something like, we know that there is a tree there because it is evident to us that there is a tree there. And um, if it is evident, and maybe also that we experience it with a certain quality of experience, right? You talked about that. And also added to that, if it is evident to us that there is a tree there with the experience being of a certain quality, then there is a tree there, right? Um, and I was asking about how we justify each of those premises there and uh, 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 express some concern about a regress argument. But if then you're going to say that that's actually not how we know that there's a tree there because um, there's like 
levels of realness or something like that, you're going to say that I don't even I don't even know what that means, actually, because like, are we just finding our belief that there's a tree there or not? Like, I don't see how you can say that, like, well, we're just slightly closer to our belief that there's a tree there being accurate that yeah i just i don't even understand how the view is working anymore like wh- how how does the justification work so more real means uh you know like the way people with an out of body experiences describe it as as the experience is more vivid their, their their vision is better they're thinking faster they can see colors that they can't you know when when they when they're seeing you know when it's a veridical and they're seeing the hospital room they don't make the description but when they go somewhere else and they're you know in some other realm many of them will describe seeing colors that don't exist here. So by more real, I'm kind of getting at that. So when you're in a dream, it's kind of foggy. Like sometimes you'll have a vivid dream, but generally it's not quite as vivid as waking life. So that's kind of what I'm getting uh, that doesn't at. Seem to, that doesn't seem to work to me. Vividness is not the same as real, right? So so you was, so let's go back to the mango analogy. You were saying that, okay, okay so we, it's not evident to us that we've tasted like the maximally ripe mango, but it may be evident or you're saying it is evident that we've tasted a more ripe mango than the previous one. Okay, I think maybe I could agree with that, but I don't think that gets switched to where, where you want to be because the 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 proposition here that's evident to us, it well, the experience that we have is that um, of comparative mango ripeness, right? Um, so how does that apply to our other beliefs, say about the reality of other minds or the external world, the reality of the external world, which you mentioned before. So I don't know that there's like a spectrum here that we're like moving in one direction. Like, yeah, the mango is more ripe. Like what's the an- analog of the mango being more ripe? Like y- y- you're appearing to appealing to vividness, but that just seems wrong. Like wh- when I experience things in the world, it's not the vividness of the experience that tells me whether it's veridical. Like I could have a more vivid experience if I'm on drugs or hallucinating, or, or maybe the vividness of the experience depends on how much light there is. Um, or, or you know whether I'm wearing my glasses or things like that. That those are all totally separate from the nature of the reality that that I'm forming beliefs about. So I just I don't think vividness works as a ground for that. And so then I would ask, well, what what is the analog of like ripeness for the mango analogy that's going to a- apply to like inferences about other minds or the external world? So the the an analog for the ripeness is the quality of the experience. So there's a qualitative difference between a green mango and yep. a ripe mango, and there's a qualitative difference yep. between a dream and waking life. So, I mean, how would you describe, how would you explain how we know that you know, we're in, that the dream is less real than waking life? You know, when, when we're in a bad dream, we wake up and think, oh, thank God, that was just a dream. Well, again, I don't think the phrase less real really makes a lot of sense. So uh, the, what you said before about ontology being tied up with epistemology, I think is is correct, unfortunately. <laughs> By the way, I, 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 you know, I think those sorts of things make more sense under coherentism because otherwise it would seem that you could split things up. But anyway, that, but, that's but just But the dream's aside, so. fully coherent with itself. Uh, well, actually, I think it often isn't. I mean, it depends what sort of dreams you have. I don't know. Maybe they're different to mine. But <laughs> but again, put, putting that aside, because I, I want to try to answer your question more directly. So um, it, how do I know that there's a that my uh, experiences in my dream are not experiences that I have in the real external world? Maybe I'll put it that way, because I don't like the phrase more real. But f- if I phrase it that well, way, the then I think it makes more sense. the dream is a world all of its own. Oh, well, what do you mean by world? Well, realm. <laughs> realm well no there's no what it's i mean when you're in the dream, a dream is a series of a, thoughts just, that i have essentially yeah but it's not a place when you're in the dream, it's not a set of things it feels like a place it's, it has the appearance of being a place uh yeah so but it's a series of perceptions essentially i guess you could say well, not, so not sensory is, so but, is waking life we're having a series of perceptions yeah okay the world is a so theory the that we attach is, to it yeah, that's right. So the question is, why do I make different inferences about the experiences I have in waking life compared to those that I have in a dream state? Is that what you're yeah. asking? Because in one state, in one case, I make inferences that there's some correspondence there, and the other one I don't, essentially, or at least usually. Because some, sometimes I dream about the real world, right? But sometimes I don't. Like it, there's a difference there. So anyway, ha- why do I make a difference? Well, again, I'm going to give at a broad brush the same answer that I that I give to anything, right? It's coherent, just right. Well, it, it fits better. Um, so what, what, I mean, the thing is when you're in a dream state, at least for me, uh, as you've actually mentioned, your cognitive faculties are usually not, um, sharp. Uh, so you can't necessarily make the same type of inferences or deductions. So it's a little bit hard to compare here, but if I imagine trying to make sense of, of things in the dream world where, for example, I may be in one place and then the next like scene or whatever, I'm just in a different place and there's no sort of connection between those. I'd be like, well, 
how do I explain having got from one place to another place with no intervening time and then just doing a completely different thing? That It's hard to make you sense just of that have a perception. different ontology about space and time. Yeah, you would. Absolutely. So then the question would be, what ontology would you construct on the basis of all of these dream perceptions? And then how would that compare with the ontology that we have of it being a dream? And it being a dream is going to fit better with that. Because again, we have a whole set of beliefs about the fact that we dream when we go to sleep. Because, okay, let, let me try to answer this in a different way. There are people uh, who think that when we dream, we actually are, in a, some sense, like going to a different place, like our consciousness is experiencing somewhere different or whatever. Um, and people have thought throughout history that dreams are not just things that we sort of imagine, but they're, they're sort of gateways to other realms or possibilities or the past or whatever, or, or the future. So, so, so maybe we can think of it in those terms. How can I distinguish those two explanations of my dream experiences. And then uh, again, I would say, well, we compare it to all of the other views we have about the nature of reality and and see which is the best explanation. And from my point of view, the non-veridical dream, that is uh, explanation, the idea that when we have dreams, it's not referring to anything outside of like any other reality. It's just sort of thoughts around in our heads is a better fit uh, of the set of experiences. Um, and there's various things that I could give to that, including some neurobiological stuff, some sociological stuff, internal stuff on the basis of that I have all sorts of dreams that don't cohere with each other very well at all. And it's hard to even imagine how I could concoct a world that fits them all together. Maybe I could say that there's multiple dream worlds that I go to that have their own rules, but then that's looking very ad hoc and not parsimonious. And I compare that to um, a, a view of, of, the, of that we have about dreams just being something that uh, sort of a combination of memories and other things that happens when we go to sleep, you know, and I just find that that's a better explanation. Right. Yeah. I, again, I haven't debated coherentism before, so I'm, I'm unfamiliar with this territory. I've always just heard coherentism and kind of shrugged it off like, oh, it's just circular reasoning. You know, you, you, you put together a bunch of things that cohere with one another and you have no way of knowing if any of it is true. Again, I, I brought this point up. So I've always just dismissed yeah, so it's, it. It's not a theory of truth, right? It's a theory of epistemic justification. And, and similar questions are going to apply to the foundationalist. So, so foundationalism, again, I think at least traditionally understood, I mean, generally people are interested in both, right? But th that's why I distinguish the notion of a theory of knowledge, which is justified true belief, and then a theory of justification, which is just trying to explain how this notion of justification works. Because you can have a belief that's justified but false, and, and that presumably could follow from any epistemology. Yeah, so... I mean, it, I think an epistemology needs to be able to make room for that as a possibility, right? So, so yeah. The, the fact that you can be a coherentist and have a coherent set of beliefs that are wrong, I don't think is by itself a criticism of coherentism, because that could be just the same for any other epistemology as well. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so, yeah, so I questioned you about, I mean, you gave a logical explanation and it, it seems to hold up. And then my question just comes back, it just pushed the question back further that, again, I, we, we went through that with parsimony. Um, I, sh I should respond to this because this is a, a common objection. Sure. Is vividly, could someone vividly believe that God's telling them to execute apostates? So there's there's two things I would say to that. One is, you know, if again, it's the green mango thing. You know, someone who thinks God's telling them to go and kill people is, is drinking the Kool-Aid. <laughs> They're eating the green mangoes and thinking it's a ripe mango. And this is where intellectual humility is so important, you know, like, it's one thing if I think God has revealed perfect knowledge to, in Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. It's another thing if I think I have perfectly understood that knowledge and it's my job to go around telling everybody the word of God. You know, you know the idea that my interpretation of it is perfect is something that I need to attach a, 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 a healthy amount of intellectual humility towards. And when you have that, then it's like, well, is God really, you know, I think God's telling me to go and kill somebody, but like, you know, I could be wrong. I think that's kind of a healthy thing to have. And that the quality of that experience is different versus when God's actually telling me something because, you know, God's all loving. So he would not be telling you to go and do that. And second of all, uh, from the outside perspective, we, we can assess whether somebody is being told something by God or not based on the quality of their characters. So I brought up virtue epistemology and, you know, appeals to spiritual authority, you know, like as, as are given in Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. So we can distinguish the spiritual authority from the, the false guru by their moral characters. So if somebody is representing God, they should be displaying the highest degrees of compassion and other 
you know, ethics that make a good person. So we can just discredit, you know, just on surface level, anyone who's telling them that God's telling us that God's telling them to go and kill people. And so if we think God's telling us to go and kill someone, we should remember this point about God being all loving. And that's clearly a self-evident thing. So people can be deluded and crazy and say that they're actually got the word of God, but they're deluded and crazy. But you could, you could have a scientist that's following the scientific process. That's also deluded and crazy. You know, the ability for someone to claim to be using a particular epistemology and be mistaken isn't really an argument against that epistemology. Yes, exactly. I was about to say this exact thing. So although I don't agree that we can have, you know, like experiences of the divine or uh, anything of the sort, and I have issues obviously with Arjuna's uh, epistemology, but I think this idea that, well, could you believe that, you know, you've uh, experienced God telling you to do something? I mean, you can obviously, right? You can believe that, but that doesn't really say anything about the epistemology. The, The ISIS member could just as equally have inferred that God uh, wants them to do this on the basis of a series of inferences made from a set of foundational axioms that they take to be self-evident, or they could have arrived at it on the basis of, uh, you know, uh, a function that they believe is um, reliable, and then that they uh, carry out the actions that you know they believe God's told them to do. Or they could have arrived at it on the basis of a set of coherent beliefs that you know that they believe is maximally coherent, you know, about the world. So, like, you can justify beliefs on different epistemologies and and arrive to wildly different conclusions, you know, depending on where you start with and what your evidence is and so forth. And I mean, and of course, people make mistakes in, con- in conducting inferences. So the, the point is, this is why I'm trying to emphasize that when we're talking about epistemology, and specifically when we're talking about the structure of knowledge, as this is sometimes called, and we're debating about like coherentism versus foundationalism, um, we're talking about how beliefs are justified, not about which beliefs are true. And now, obviously, those are going to relate, like they're going to come there's a relationship between those two, but they're not the same thing. Like, again, the fact that you can, that in a certain epistemic situation, you can justify a false belief is not uh, a problem of an epistemology. I mean, this is what Oppie was saying repeatedly and not exactly those terms when, when you had a discussion with him that he was saying that, you know, theists can be perfectly rational in believing what they believe. Um, and, you know, they just, he was saying they just have different evidence essentially, or different testimonies was another way he, he described that. Um, and th- that's, well, I mean, what I think as well. So someone is rational if they've re- responded appropriately to like the set of experiences and evidence that they've had. And I don't think that anyone is fully rational, but I think that people can be, you know, rational to a significant degree in terms of the way they respond, uh, like epistemically and the beliefs they form. But but depending on where you start from and what experiences you have, you might end up in a very wrong set of beliefs. But, you know, this has happened mostly through, uh, repeatedly throughout history when people believed all sorts of things that we now regard as false. But at the time, that they may have had very good reasons for it. Yeah, right. I think this um, suicide bomber argument re- clarifies things a bit. You know, virtue epistemology presupposes what virtue is. Isis consider ah, murdering yes. apostates so I, as I, a virtue. I did want to ask about this, although I don't. <laughs> I mean that that example is maybe a bit extreme, but um, I mean, yeah, it does. It does sort of el- elicit the point. So, so, but uh, when you were saying before that. Um, so you you know that someone is not speaking from God if they say to do something that is you know horrific, right? Because God would never say to do something like that. Um, you know, I I think that that makes sense, but but I do think that there is potentially an issue there with respect to the how the overall system of justification works. If if you're a foundationalist or you're appealing to like things that are evident, because um, you know, so, suppose someone. Well, I mean, there's two cases. Someone could declare to you that they've experienced God, or you could yourself have an experience. Um, maybe we'll just start with the case of someone declares to you, right? Um, and they say, hey, I've had this experience or a set of experiences, or you know, I've meditated for a long time and read all these scriptures, and I've come to this belief that we should kill these people, right? Um, and all, in every religious tradition, there's, all, there's like some people or someone who's done that, right? So it's not entirely hypothetical, but without referring to a specific case, I'll just keep it generic. So... Uh, and then, and then we, we have to start, okay, how do I respond to that? Now, one possibility, it could be that, well, they're wrong, you know, that because, you know, God wouldn't want to do that because that's not virtuous, right? And so we can reject, and they're just mistaken about um, thinking that God's spoken to them. But it seems that at least in principle, there's another possibility. The other possibility is that we are wrong about what we think is virtuous. And in fact, we didn't understand, um, you know, the, the fullness of what God wants or or his reasons for things, right? And so actually the things that we thought uh, some of the things that we thought were 
virtuous were, are in fact vices or and vice versa, right? Um, that's at least an in principle possibility. And in fact, I think that, um, you know, th this must be always true to some extent with some things. So, uh, as long as you, we have some sort of moral um, changes in our moral beliefs over time, there's always times when we think we start by thinking something was right and then realize it was wrong or vice versa, right? So my question would be, how do we make those inferences, whether it's with respect to other people's claiming to have divine insight or maybe our own experience and thinking that we have divine insight? How do I decide whether I need to change what I thought was right or whether I should uh, change or like accept or deny what's, whether someone has divine knowledge? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the common uh rhetoric for the epistemology given inside the tradition is guru sadhu and shastra so guru sadhu is kind of similar to guru sadhu means a person who's who's realized in practicing and shastra means scripture so if it's confirmed by all three so the guru is the person you've taken shelter of sort of spiritual guidance and the sadhu is someone who you might not have directly taken shelter of, but but they're on the path and they're they've realized some things and then scripture is you know the, the word of god so to speak so if all three of those things are in agreement then you can be sure of something but you know if you've read scripture and you think you've got an understanding and so it's a, you know you think it's true it's your interpretation of scripture but then you go to your guru and you go to and you see what the sadhus say and they disagree then you must be wrong so when you get all three in agreement, of course, you know, you do get the problem that's like, oh, well, you just get your interpretation of scripture and you go around and you find a guru who agrees with you and then, <laughs> and then you become guru. So, um, yeah, there, there's a, the solution to that is, you know, the buck has to stop somewhere. It's not like you go to the doctor and you get a diagnosis you don't like, and you think I'd like a second opinion. You, know, you find a spiritual authority who you have faith in, and then you you defer to them, you know, I'm, not to the extent of gaslighting yourself, but just in those areas where, you know, you, you know, so by gaslighting, I mean, you know, your guru tells you to drink the Kool-Aid. No, you don't drink the Kool-Aid. You, you use your common sense. You keep your wits about you. <laughs> well, that doesn't seem right because then aren't you arrogating to your common, because I don't think that works, right? Because our common sense could be corrupted There's a, right, by false consciousness about what we think is right and wrong. Maybe common sense says that it's all right to eat animals. And in fact, for some people, that's absolutely their common sense, right? But but that's actually wrong, right? So, I mean, and you can use other examples if you don't like that one, but, but you see what I'm saying? Why do we rely on our common sense as fundamental? Uh, so we we also have Paramatma in the heart. So Paramatma is a form of God who sits in the heart of every living entity and gives us guidance. So for someone who's turning their back on God, the super soul is the other word, it's the English translation. And the heart will um, kind of leave us to it because we have our independent desires and he's allowing us to, you know, attempt to fulfill our selfish desires. But for someone who's turning to God and sincerely seeking him, the super soul and the heart will provide guidance. So if we're sincere, it's, you know, it's possible for the guru to fall down. So if you're just blindly following everything the guru says, you could be led astray. But if you're following God, and, you know, by, by virtue of following God, you've accepted a guru and taken shelter of a guru. If that guru then gives an instruction that's not coming from God, Krishna or God in the heart will reveal that to you. And if you have a, a proper understanding of epistemology, then you'll listen to that. But some people, I mean, I, I'm sure you can agree that this is at least a good epistemology for religious people to hold, even if you object to it for other reasons. I think if everybody lived like this, we'd have a lot less religious fanaticism in the world because a lot of religious fanaticism comes from people ignoring their intuitions in the heart. You know, their, what I would say, their, their guidance from super soul in the heart and instead listening to something, you know, like, I, I feel like this is what I should be doing to serve God, but other people are telling me this and it doesn't feel right to me. You know, th so your, your, your objection would kind of be like, well, how do you know that's right? So I would again say it's the, the strength of the conviction. So some things, you know, like, you know, I might think, oh, but I really like eating meat, you, you know, and it's really tasty. So I think eating meat's all right. You know, that we can sort of understand when we're doing that, when it's just like, yeah, but I don't really want to change that. So I'm just going to, 
you know, it's fun and I enjoy it and it's hard work if I change, I'm not going to change it. Whereas in other cases, it's like, no, this is wrong. Children should not be treated that way. I don't care what the scripture says. Some, if, you know, either that these people must be misinterpreting the scripture because children shouldn't be treated that way or, you know, whatever it is, that's an easy example because, you know, how children should be treated well is usually pretty self-evident. I don't agree at all. I mean, the way children have been treated throughout history is completely different to what we would regard as acceptable. People used to send their children out to work at extremely young ages. Uh, people uh, in many cultures would expose infants that they didn't want or couldn't couldn't care for, which we'd regard today as horrific. Uh, people used to beat children. Um, there's all sorts of practices that we wouldn't that, that seemed fine to them, as far as I know. In those societies, these things were accepted, and we wouldn't regard those as correct today. So I, I don't really buy the self-evident notion at all for things like that. In fact, for most mor moral issues, things that seem self-evident to people in the past, like uh, that slavery was part of society, for example, was self-evident to a lot of people in a lot of societies. Now, there was often ideas about who could be a slave or how slavery, how slaves should be treated. Um, but the idea that it was completely wrong at all times for all people to own slaves is, I think, a pretty unusual for ancient societies. Um, and likewise, for many other things like equality of women and so forth, uh, these things were not self-evident to them, and I don't think that we we it's we really have the justification just to to say that well because I, and you mentioned before that it's the strength of the conviction. I think that's a terrible basis because many people are very strongly convicted in very wrong beliefs, moral and otherwise, and I don't think that the strength really has anything to do with um, how how true something is. I mean, do, do you think that if mm -hmm. I just believe something strongly enough, then that's a reason to believe that it's true? Well, what's what's the alternative? on the basis of the reasons that I have for believing it, which is completely independent from how strongly I believe it. Like, I might believe that something has a lot of good evidence, but just not feel strongly convicted about it, but just think, well, yeah, the evidence points there, but I don't feel strongly I, about it. It's just where I think the evidence points to. That, that's a different, I mean, at least I, for me, that, I'm that's a different way of thinking. I'm conflating the logical support for something with the emotional conviction i i, I think there's a, you know like, i mean and and a, and a but those are often in conflict aren't they you were just saying that with respect to the meat eating right we maybe have this emotional drive that we want to keep eat, eating meat and we want to justify it, but then there's this other set of beliefs from logic or whatever else that we're thinking oh actually i shouldn't do that often they're in and that's just an example often they're in conflict so i don't why would we conflate those yeah i mean that's a good point um but in a human being, there, there, there's you know there's tension, but we can't hold tension for long. The, the 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 tension will be there for a period of time, and we'll either, you know, through cognitive dissonance, ignore the facts that create the tension, or we'll change our emotions about something. And um, this this is part inextricably linked with the process of advancing in Krishna consciousness too. Um, but you know, when somebody feels a strong conviction that you know that's child abuse. There's also a logic behind that because, you know, this is, you know, all the human psychology and, you know, developmental psychology and there's, you know, but there's so much of it linked together. So, you know, if, say the Kool-Aid example, you know, we're all going to commit suicide. It's like, well, I mean, the, the emotions, but, you know, the things that we feel really strong convictions about the logic and the emotions are on the same team. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't actually understand that, but but I want to because I don't think that's true in a lot of cases. But I want to come back to a point that you said. So you were saying so so what I'm trying to do is push towards how we know when we should accept um, what seems to us to be the right thing versus what the text says or what the guru says or, or whatever else, right? W when those are potentially in conflict. Um, and you said one thing you appealed to was common sense, and I said, well, you know, why would we just rely on our common sense? It seems that that can often be a flaw. But then you said, well, there's this. I don't remember the word that you used for it, but you said that there's a sort of faculty or perception or, or revelation no, or something like that that you get from God. Yeah, right. So that comes from God. And if we know how to interpret that correctly, then then we'll have a guide there. Um, and that's a more reliable notion, by the way, but or at least it seems to me that it is. But ag again, I would ask, well, how do we know that we've sort of interpreted that correctly? Um, because we have to uh, like assume that we've sort of gained correct um uh, yeah, that we've sort of gained correct access to that, and we, we know sort of what what God is saying that we should do. Um, and then, well, how do we know we've correctly done that? Um, and it it seems to me that like whatever you're going to say, I could just ask, well, but how do you know that you've interpreted that correctly, or that you've you've acted correctly in response to that? And it doesn't seem to me that anything is going to be end up as something that's just evident and um, impossible for us to be wrong about. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I don't. I mean, 
possibly wrong about. I mean, I don't see how the same thing doesn't also apply to your worldview. Oh, it does. But, uh, but the thing is, I'm not a foundationalist, right? So what I'm not trying to do is start with some things, some foundations that I think are, are certain and then derive consequences from that. So I don't say things like, it is evident to me that there's a tree there, or it is evident that we shouldn't treat children that way. I mean, you know, I might, but not at a not when I'm having an epistemological discussion, right? So I think that some things are more, like we can justify to a strong extent, you might say they're evident. But when I'm having an epistemology discussion, I don't use that language because I don't think that's how beliefs are justified. I think they're justified as a sort of a, well, in a web of beliefs on the basis of how the overall view, uh, web of beliefs um, you know, makes sense or has explanatory power is another phrase that I like. So what I wouldn't say is the sort of things that you're saying, that it's just evident that you should treat children that way, or it's evident that God wants me to do this, or it's evident that there's a tree there, because I don't think that is true. And I think that there are always these skeptical questions to be asked about, well, how do I know that I've not fundamentally misunderstood something about morality or about how to treat children or about the nature of God, right? So yes, the uncertainty does apply. I guess my point is that I don't think that that uncertainty is an undermining factor for my epistemology because it doesn't require that I have a or it doesn't require that I start with a foundation that is evident and therefore from what you said it has to be certain whereas you're claiming for that your epistemology does rely on that. And that's actually what I would argue is a reason to accept coherentism, right? Because you don't need to find something. Like this is a classical argument against foundationalism, that you have to find these things that, that you can just be evident in, uh, that, that are evident and you can build up from. And I just don't think that there are such things. And that's why I think that you should come over to team coherentism <laughs> precisely because of this issue. <laughs> right. You're spreading the good word of coherentism. Well, I mean, for a lot of purposes, it doesn't matter that much, right? Yeah. But if we're having a, a, a discussion about epistemology, well, then, yeah, these things are relevant. Right. But for, for everyday purposes, it may not matter that much exactly what structure you have, because for a lot of purposes, we'll agree on things. Right. But um, that's why I think it's interesting to talk about areas where we disagree, like, you know, with respect to knowledge of the divine and, and so forth, uh, because there you might say, well, I, I can know these things because of a particular set of inferences or structure of beliefs uh, that depends on a particular epistemology. And if I don't accept that epistemology, well, then I'm probably not going to accept the conclusions you get to. So, so that's why I think that this epistemology stuff can matter, because I know it's often quite abstract and people get a bit frustrated, right? But this is where I think it can matter if it affects down the line what we come to believe. I mean, so even on the co coherentist view, you've, you've got, say, two different coherent views, and you, you want to say this one's more coherent than that one. That's, a, that's an assessment you have to make, and you're using logic to make that, but you're using an epistemic faculty to assess that and you know when i when i say you know we're taking something as false foundational i don't think it necessarily needs to be with complete certainty it just has to be the best conclusion we can possibly get to which is the only thing we can do at any one time so and I, one thing we do have certainty of on my epistemology is that my current level of realization is greater than the level of realization i had when I believe different things. So that's one thing we do need, do need to know with certainty. When we're presented with, you know, two different views, we do need to be able to assess which one of them is the more true or the, the more accurate one. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree. Well, mostly I agree with that, except I wouldn't say I'm certain about that. So let me give an example from my life, right? Because uh, I don't want to make presumptions about your journey. But from my journey, I, I was raised as a Mormon, right? And so I had a set of beliefs related to Mormonism and what I believe is true there. And obviously, I, I left that uh, so, quite some time ago, and I'm now an atheist and a naturalist and so forth. Now, of course, I think that I've gotten sort of closer to, uh, closer. well, I probably shouldn't phrase it that way. My set of beliefs is more coherent with the, the broad set of things that is known now. And I, I've increased my knowledge and that I think that my beliefs are a better approximation to reality than they were before. There's different ways we can say that. Um, but would I say that I know with certainty that uh, I hold more true beliefs now or maybe the overall number's not the best way, but to say that but, but my beliefs overall are a better fit to reality than they are before. No, I wouldn't say that that's certain. I would say that it's very highly likely to be true but I wouldn't say it's absolutely certain because there's always poss possibility of, of doubt uh, and making faulty inferences because you're saying it relies on cognitive faculties. I absolutely agree with that. That's why I'm a fallibilist and that's why I, call, I think of myself as a skeptic as well because I take these problems uh, of skepticism seriously. And, and most of the time, it's not like solipsism or brain in a vat, although they have their place as thought experiments. But most of the time, it's just more ordinary levels of skepticism like, 
am I deluding myself? Am I engaged in, uh, am I suffering cognitive biases? Um, am I reading too much belief, uh, things that just support my existing belief system? Um, and, and so I think that that should be forever present as part of our um, journey through life, essentially, as trying to navigate these uncertainties and doubts in a, in a way where hopefully we, we, in doing so we can um, not fully overcome them, but do better than if we, if we weren't uh, grappling with these things. So you, you, Mormonism could could be true, and you could just be mistaken. Is is that that fit? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a possibility. Now I don't accord it high probability or high likelihood or right. whatever word you want to use. But I, the the point I was making there is I wouldn't want to say that it's it is certain uh, th that it is false or that I've I've moved in a better direction. Just very highly likely. And indeed, there's very few, if any, beliefs that I would say we can hold with certainty. Um, and that that fits well. That's coherent with a variety of other beliefs that I hold about the way we arrive at knowledge, like science isn't certain and so on, but that's a topic for another discussion. I want to come back to the, the Kool-Aid, drinking the Kool-Aid example, because yep. I mean, not that we want to think about a great tragedy like that much, but the, the point is, I think my epistemology has a solution to prevent that kind of thing from happening, and you're pushing back on it. So I, I, your pushback, I think, could kind of just fit the same category as what I'm saying. So it's like, okay, you know, let's say the guru is telling me to jump off a bridge and I'm just like, no, I know God doesn't want me to jump off this bridge. I know that's not an instruction coming from God. And, you know, I've got all these reasons behind it, but it's also just a direct apprehension of truth I have that God in my heart is telling me not to do that, even though this person's my guru and they've given me good instructions so yep. far. But now this instruction they're giving me is not from God. So surely it's a good thing if I follow that and don't jump off the bridge, right? I'm, I'm sure we can at least agree on that. Yeah. Part. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to agree that you shouldn't jump off the bridge, right? And I, I'm happy with everything you said, except when you said that I have the direct apprehension that God doesn't want me to do this because I'm going to deny that. Uh, well, I should be careful here. I obviously don't believe there is a God, so I don't think God told you anything, but I think that there could be a God who may actually tell you things. But what I'm going to deny sort of even more strongly, if, if that sort of makes sense, is that you could have a direct and certain apprehension of what God wanted you to do, even if there was a God, because I think that there's always a further question as to, well, how do I know that that's what God is telling me to do? Um, and again, we know that there that people can be mistaken about this. And if we're going to say, well, you can just sort of, you know, it when you see it, um, then we go back to the mango example and say, well, you might be able to tell the difference between two states. Like I can tell that, well, now when I, in this state that I'm in, when I think that God is talking to me, it is qualitatively different to the state I had last year or whatever else when I thought God was talking to me. But I don't know how you can tell that this is like the the, the true or the, the the most advanced or the the properly correct state. Because maybe the guru is in like a state up here and and you just can't perceive of the level of like spiritual awareness that he's reached so to speak this is why i was asking before about if there's a difference between what the guru says or what the texts say or what you know you think then how do you adjudicate that um and it seems and this is actually a criticism i've raised of religion before it seems to me that a lot of people um rely on basically it basically comes down to what they personally think or feel at, at some level um and i don't i mean i gotta be careful what i say there because i think that we should do what we think is rational right but if it's coming from an internal source that we call like intuition or spiritual awareness or something that we can't really explain or justify, uh, but we think is sort of evident to us and we, we ground that in certainty, I think that actually can lead to uh, problematic circumstances because I, basically I think that everything should be doubted and subject to skepticism and, and critical inquiry. And whenever people put things beyond that, whether that's a text, whether that's a guru, whether that's their own intuitions or perceptions, anything, whenever they put that beyond that, uh, I think that that can lead to, to, to problems. Um, sorry, someone's just complaining that their comment that was offensive got deleted. YouTube screens for offensive contents and 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 deletes them. I've got that as a setting because I don't want vulgar yep. things on my channel. Um, no, that's fair enough. So, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was just saying that everything should be subject to doubt and critical inquiry. Right. I mean, if if, if we can't doubt everything, otherwise we would wouldn't be able to arrive at any kind of tr conceptions of anything. Uh, yeah, sorry, that was what I was going to say. So, you know, if, if, so the guru is telling me to jump off the bridge, Krishna in the heart is telling me not to, but let's suppose I had a feeling that God in the heart was telling me something that didn't make any sense. And my guru was telling me the opposite logic couldn't make any sense of it. And it wasn't in the scripture. Then I would be 
uh, sound, I, I would be, then I should doubt that that's an instruction coming from God in the heart because you can be mistaken about these kinds of things. So there's, there's checks and balances. So like uh, this was the point I was going to make about. So if you have, you know, three different things that you're 80% sure of, and then you have chains of inference built on that, and that ar arrives at you being 40% certain, each chain of inference arrives at you being 40% certain, but three different chains of inference have given you the same conclusion. Uh, I'm not sure what happens if you average 40% or how, how you'd add percentages together. So I've now got three different lines of inference that have all given me individually a 40% certainty of something. My certainty is now more than 40%. I'm not sure quite. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So, well, I mean, see, you see, I, I, I want to be careful here because, I mean, it's easy to sort of straw man views, but talking about that, the way you've just articulated that sounds more in the direction of coherentism than foundationalism. Because again, what, what I want to try to focus on here is the idea that we start with something, and you've talked a lot about things being evident, which you said means, or part of that is certain, right? And that is how I, I would understand that as well. And then we can build things on from that. So I have a, a uh, I have an experience that something's evident to me, so I think that that tree like exists, or that the mango is ripe, so I think that that's it's ripe, or that God is telling me this, so I, I think that, and then, and then I build on from that, things that I deduce from that. Um, now, Instead of that, because because I don't think that's a correct epistemology. If instead I say, look, there's there's a few different lines of evidence there. There's there's what the scriptures say. There's what the guru says. There's what I sort of think inside. Maybe there's some other things as well that's, that go in there. And then none of them can be taken as certain. Like, none of them is evident in that sense. Although I think uh, maybe they think that's generally pretty good, pretty reliable, or whatever I want to say. But then when they converge, then I'm really confident that that's the right thing. And then when one of them's out, then I'm a bit less confident. And then when they're all pointing different directions, then maybe I'm just confused, right? So that seems a, a lot more in the line of how I would describe the situation, where we don't have any evident certain starting point. We, we just sort of have a web of things that uh, ideally coalesce, and then we can be confident. When they don't, then then we're sort of more, more unclear about what to do. That just seems how I would describe the situation. I mean, I think that maybe the views are kind of um, feedback off one another and are, are tied in together. Like on coherentism, you need yeah. to have some evidence for each particular line of evidence in order for it to mean anything when you combine them all together. You can't just have, you know, zero certainty of everything, combine that all together and say, here's my coherent worldview. It's like, oh, yeah, could just be. F yeah, well, that, yeah, <laughs> well, but that I wouldn't advocate. So when I say we need to doubt everything, I mean, it doesn't mean assign a probability of zero to all our beliefs. <laughs> that, that, that's not how you doubt either. Right? Yeah. Um, again, it's all in proportion to, you know, the, the set of overall beliefs that I have. So if I have an experience of something that seems way outside of what I would think is possible or, or very likely under my given worldview, then I'm going to doubt that pretty heavily. And again, I think that that makes sense. And that is kind of what we do in, in general. Um, and when we don't do that, I think we can often go wrong. Uh, but then if something that happens, that's pretty much what I would expect, then I, I, I might doubt that a little bit, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's like if someone goes out and they says, oh, I saw the moon tonight. I'm like, well, you know, that's not that unlikely. I mean, maybe they were wrong. It could be, but it's pretty likely. I mean, I guess it depends if the moon's visible now, but you know, whereas if they say I, I saw, um, uh, I saw little green aliens flying in a flying saucer and landing and, you know, um, harvesting in the backyard. That, uh, I have a whole set of beliefs that make that pretty unlikely, not impossible, but a lot less likely than, than seeing the moon, right? So, I mean, this is a fairly basic point, but I'm going to doubt things differently uh, depending on how they fit with my existing set of beliefs. Now, of course, if I get enough reports of people seeing those aliens and in different circumstances and so on and so on, then I start to doubt them less and less, you know, potentially d depending on a bunch of other factors. But again, that's how I think about the way that doubt works with respect to um, updating a belief with uh, with new evidence. Right. Maybe maybe we agree more than we thought. I, I, I'm <laughs> allergic to coherentism because uh, it's tied in with postmodernism and postmodernism is a catastrophe. Well, remember that I have been articulating a coherentist or a sketch of a one version, I've got to be careful here, of a coherentist version of justification. That is different to a coherentist version of truth. So the theories of truth are different to theories of justification. Oh, so if you, so coherentist theories, if you make an ontology out of it, then you're a postmodernism and then a postmodernist. And... Well, you see, postmodernism is mostly defined by what it doesn't believe, not what it does believe. So it's pretty hard to say, but I, I would say that postmodernists are generally very skeptical about any any worldview or any set of beliefs. And that's different to what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you, you find the best set of beliefs worldview you have and you sort of, you, you, you argue for that while being skeptical and receptive to new evidence. But I, I feel like what 
people in the postmodern camp generally do is they want to tear down uh, worldviews or or systems of beliefs um, for a whole bunch of reasons. A lot of them are more political than uh, necessarily purely philosophical, I guess, but um, and not necessarily put much up in its place of any particular but like postmodernists are generally not interested in building elaborate theories because that's precisely what they think that we shouldn't be doing for a whole bunch of reasons. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's problematic to assign like postmodernism any particular set of beliefs other than that. I don't necessarily think they're going to agree with me about, um, you know, uh, my particular brand of reductionist naturalism and all of the things that I would say. I, I don't think they're going to go with that uh, just as much as they're probably not going to go along with with your set of, of beliefs. But yeah, I, I, the, the reason I raise this uh, is because coherentist theory of truth, which maybe is associated with postmodernism, although I don't think it's not the same thing, uh, would be to say that a truth is defined by the, you know, coher- some sort of coherence relation within a set of propositions. But that's not what I hold. Um, I lean towards a correspondence theory of truth, although deflationary theories of truth are also interesting to me. Uh, Alan, shouldn't we have, I can't see all three. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I don't hold to a coherentist theory. Oops. I think this meme describes postmodernism well. Pre-modernism and there's a dark postmodernism. Is, mo- oh, sorry, modernism gets crushed and then postmodernism sort of <laughs> tracks it resurrected back. in a hideous way. <laughs> Does that yeah, look look accurate? Uh, look, not entirely, because I think that modernism is not just trying to uh, like crush <laughs> pre-modernism, but it's trying to replace it with something else. Whereas postmodernists, I feel like, want to tear down all worldviews like to take an example that i'm aware of um uh, marxism is can be put i think in a modernist camp because it's attempting to be a rationalist um scientific theory of you know history and and human societies and politics and, and governance and so forth or and economics um so i think that that goes in the modernist camp whereas postmodernists uh, reject Marxism because of its systematizing and because of the discourses and all of the assumptions that that needs to make. So they want to tear down all of this sort of stuff, in pre-modern and modern. Oh, so they're, they're not necessarily so replaced with anything specific. If they're rejecting Marxism, then they're better than modernists. It's better than modernism. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, I didn't want to make the discussion too political. I just wanted to use this as an example because a lot of these postmodernists were reacting, like Foucault, for example, were, were reacting to Marxist thought. Yeah, right. Um, and and often not satisfied with it for a, for a number of reasons, but, but just as much they'll react to, uh, you know, um, the type of Christian worldviews that I often debate with and with my sort of, um, reductionist science, uh, informed, uh, worldview with, I mean, politically I'm sort of liberals as they wouldn't like that either. So I don't know, I'm just trying to paint a bit of a picture of how that fits in, but, but yeah, so I'm not, I'm not one of those and I'm not, I don't adhere to a coherentist theory of truth either. So I, I don't, I don't actually think it has any particular connection to, um, yeah, to, to postmodernism or denial of a reality or because I'm a realist, so I believe that there's an external world and you know, all of these other sorts of things. Right. Well the postmodernists give coherentism a bad name. Maybe, yeah. I don't I don't know too much about that other than yeah, you can coherentism can apply to different things. Um just like realism can apply to different things. You should be realist about some things but not others. Um and just like um oh that was another oh yeah, like um um what was the word? What was it like internalist and externalist that can apply different things as well so cognitivist and non-cognitivist that's another example like a lot of these terms can apply in different realms like moral or epistemic or yeah, ontological right. so you, you just got to sort of be careful about the domain you're talking about anyway that was and i want to be clear that i've been talking about epistemological domain today okay well that was a bit of a tangent so i mean with coherentism so let's say you do have a whole bunch of lines of evidence converging on theism. So you chant Hare Krishna and you get the experience which you were told that you'd get. So sometimes the argument is given like a, a, a scientific experiment. So, you know, one person, you know, scientists say, I've done this experiment and I've proven this. And they, they explain what they did. And the other scientists go in their labs and try to do the same thing and they get the same results. So Krishna consciousness said, if you follow these practices, the word is sadhana, which means discipline, that you do to achieve a goal, and the goal is sadhya, then, um, and there's certain signposts which are listed. So just like if someone gives you directions, you know, here's how you get here, you take this bus, you get off at this street, you walk here, and they tell you certain things you'll see along the, along the way. So you just got directions from somebody you kind of trust, but you don't really know that the directions are going to get you there. But as you're going, you see, oh, there's that building they said, I'd see, you know, here's the bus stop, here's that street they talked about. And every time you see something that you were told you'd see, you, your confidence that they've given you the correct direction 
directions grows. So by, you know, you practice Krishna consciousness and you're told eating meat's bad, you chant Hare Krishna and you realize, you know, you get this personal conviction that eating meat's bad and various other things. I, I keep giving the meat example because it's, it's such a profound experience for so many people who practice Krishna consciousness, even when they, if they give up practicing Krishna consciousness, they'll often never go back to eating meat. Yeah, let, so let me pull on that example there. So, because uh, I'm I'm not a strict vegetarian because I eat some types of fish, but um, they're, they're you know, just, I'm so I'm sympathetic to this. sea vegetables. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I wouldn't say that. I think that there is a level of suffering there. But the point I wanted to make is that I'm sympathetic to these sorts of arguments is all. Um, but, well, I, and that's where I'm sort of going to go with this, because what I'm going to ask is, are there um, sort of declarative, logical, reasons for why it is bad or wrong to eat meat oh we, sh we should we have a duty uh to be compassionate to not cause harm to other living entities and to uplift them to to you know be a force for good in the lives of other living entities so the 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 role of a king in vedic culture was to protect the praja and the word praja doesn't just mean citizens it means anyone who's taken birth in the kingdom. And uh, uh, not that that would then translate to xenophobia where they don't take birth of people, take care of people that didn't take birth locally. But, but their role, you know, like at, at times in, in, in history, there's been a Vedic king that, that was looking after the entire world. So their job was to care for it, every living entity, which include, included insects and birds and everything. So... The, the, the duty of care that we have, you know, in the Bible, it talks about having domain over the animals. You know, I think the correct way to interpret that is, you know, we, just like, you know, you could say I have domain over my kids. It doesn't mean I can turn them into slaves. It means I need to look after their needs. I'm, they're my responsibility. I, I have to care for them. So as humans, we have a special role that we can have so much influence on the world. So we need to use this influence to care for other living entities. Yeah, so uh, obviously some of the specifics are going to vary there, but that's not wholly different from what I would say. So, but so so the point there is not that I want to disagree with that. What what I want to get to is this idea that okay, so so if there's set if there's a set of reasons like you know articulable logical uh, points that can be made as to why it's wrong to eat meat, then why do I need to go through um, I don't know exactly what it is meditation rituals, reading um, texts. Uh, uh, following guru why do i need to do all that if i can just be given the reasons for not eating meat like wh wh what does that add to the process so i was distracted by this comment somebody's done the math for my 40 percent example um that apparently it turns into 60 percent for <laughs> jumping off versus not jumping off the bridge i'm not sure i follow that exactly i'd have to think about that but anyway yeah so i just had to say if you have independent lines of evidence they, they will increase um your confidence because i mean i i think what you should do is raise the power of them all being wrong which is um well anyway maybe that's not quite right anyway but uh coming coming back to the uh what was i talking about oh yeah the, the meat eating example so so why can't we just give arguments as to why it's wrong to eat meat now now you might say just to forestall you, you might say well but people just maybe won't they might like agree with the argument but they just won't be motivated to it so that that could be an issue but the, the reason I'm asking about that is because science is about finding out uh, truths about the world. It's not necessarily about changing the way that we are as people. I mean, at least that's how it comes to me. Like the scientist isn't trying to be made in a particular way. Um, and so I feel like if, if we're, if you're postulating uh, like Krishna consciousness as a method of changing people and making them better people, then I think it's not really analogous to science. But if you're postulating it as a method of arriving at knowledge, then maybe it could be considered analogous. But it seems that maybe there's a disanalogy here because in science, we look for evidences and reasons and give arguments. We don't say that like you have to go through this thing in order to believe, like experience to believe something. So there, there is a long history of debate in our tradition and, and there are many arguments that are given, but uh, people, it, it is also, it's, it's both a process of gaining knowledge and a process of transformation, but yeah, the transformation right. is a critical component to gaining knowledge. Like I, I talked to, you know, like you, you, you want to understand the, you, you know, like a scientific theory. You, there's certain intellectual virtues you need to have. You need to develop a, a high degree of mathematical acumen uh, and you need to understand abstract concepts and you need to work hard. You can't just, um, 
you know, so some things can be proven at a societal level, like, you know, and the internal combustion engine, it, it's, it, it works, you know, I, I drive my car every day and I know that, that the internal combustion engine works because I'm experiencing the fact that it works. But, you know, the, the general theory of relativity, it's like, well, okay, apparently it helps with GPS coordinate accuracy, but like, I don't really know that. I, like, you know, I I'm just, you know, giving the, the argument of a lay person, you know, like I just kind of take it on faith. But if I wanted to actually know it, I'd have to do the hard yards of studying it. It's a little bit different with, with science because with science, you can come to know these things purely through, you know, application of logic. But with Krishna consciousness, it is claimed that like the, the Greeks had this idea that knowledge is state dependent. So your access to, shall we say, esoteric truths depends on you being in a suitable level of consciousness. So, and you look through history and you'll see a lot of great philosophers. They lived principal lives. Like, uh, I mean, I, I remember hearing at Wittgenstein and he, he, you know, he might not have been the most saintly person, but he did have certain principles that he lived by. He was very austere and like, he wasn't into money and stuff. He wasn't that much of a worldly person. He, he was definitely a strange character, but, and Socrates too, you know, he was a strange character, but he lived by principles. Although, Apparently he drank a lot, which is a little bit odd from a Harry Krishna point of view to see somebody who's so, has so many deep realizations about philosophy in the world who <laughs> drank so much liquor, but that, that was what people did at the time. Well, I guess you could explain it in Krishna consciousness with a sort of um, cultural context thing that we're, we're to some extent judged by the, the time that we live in. So you don't take, you know, a great personality and remove them from their cultural context and then judge their moral character up against you know, modern times or other times, you know, I mean, also we don't want to do that because, you know, we're not going well, to it, fare too well. It seems that, well, I, I agree with that, <laughs> although it seems to me that there's no reason we wouldn't do that if we thought we had access to sort of transcendent knowledge of the good. But that, like, why wouldn't we just compare it to that? So the, the, the knowledge is to some extent revealed on a personal basis. So, you know, God is revealing himself or, you know, passing this knowledge and it's not like a purely mechanical thing. So if you're in a particular environment and you're working with, you know, within particular limitations or you've got certain options available to you and you make the best of it, then you're going to be acknowledged by God for that and given certain realizations so someone might be their moral character or the way they live their life may be of a lower standard to how somebody today lives but because they've risen above their environment more than i have they get more credit than me i i yeah i'm not really interested in the process of assigning credit i i'm more interested in the idea that w of what sources we can gain to give us access to a uh, moral knowledge and it just seems to me god's for the way you've articulated it, not really doing very much. If we're mostly restricted to what our society has, and maybe we can move a little bit above that. But like, if 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 we have access to God, um, then you know, I'd be asking all these questions. I mean, I, you know, I, I grant that it's not like a teletype service, right? But you know, you see, in principle, it seems like, well, what about this and that? All these hot button moral issues, like, well, let's let's sort out and and work out, like, what what is the right answer to all of these things. God would know this, right? So, so why aren't we getting all of these great insights and being able to answer all of these questions? I mean, unless you think that the Hare Krishnas do have all of that, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we've got all the answers. So, <laughs> read, read Srimad Bhagavatam. But, but, but the problem with that answer is that you've just said that in the past people people didn't, although maybe they just weren't like proper Hare Krishnas. I don't know. Well, I mean, in in, in India, that there's a, a history going all the way back of Vaishnavism. So like the Sampradaya is the word for a disciplic succession or a tradition. And uh, there's four of them in India. So the one that I'm a member of is, it comes, comes from Sabrama, Madhava, Gaudiya, Sampradaya. So Lord Brahma was instructed by Krishna and then he passed it on to, and it, it goes all the way down. And then at some point Madhava was a key personality and then Sri Chaitanya is a key personality, but there's an unbroken chain and there's a history all the way back through through history <clears throat> and um so there were people around that had this knowledge it's just you know and in, they in, in greece it wasn't there you know G greece was a little bit more sinful of the place and they had less knowledge but then a person like socrates rose above that to some degree and had insight from super soul in the heart of certain truths about reality as opposed to being in a tradition that has revealed knowledge has living practitioners of it then you can get more clear knowledge but my point about having risen above it's just like you know like a loving father if he can see that one of his children actually had some 
conditions that that set him back but this child actually rose above that he's gonna uh offer support to that child and if another child was in a, a more advanced situation but just like didn't do anything and you know you, you know like that there's that story in the bible of being given talents so you know you, you give a little bit of money to someone and they turn it into more money that's like oh i'm going to give that person more money you give another one of your children some money and they just like blow it all on a sports car it's like well i'm not going to give you any more money am i because you want to see that they're taking advantage of what they're given and making good use of it, not just floundering it. So I'm, I'm drawing this analogy to being given spiritual realization and knowledge. Um, this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. It seems to me that if I was raising children, right? I mean, you know, well, children are limited in understanding. I guess you could say that we are as well with respect to God. But the thing is that, so suppose I say, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of an analogy here. Okay, look, suppose I say to my kid, uh, you know, you shouldn't hit your sister. That's wrong. Okay, but maybe, maybe he keeps hitting his sister. <laughs> um, and then, I, then maybe I think, well, you know, he keeps hitting his sister, so he's not kind of got that right. I'm not going to tell him that stealing his sister's toys is is wrong because because he he hasn't really got to the level of not hitting yet. Then uh, sort of he's not going to. That's not how I do it. Like I tell them the things that are wrong that at least they can understand. Um, and even if they're not following them all, that's not mean I'm going to not going to tell them those things or likewise that they should, you know, that they should clean, should clean his room, uh, as well, even if he's not doing the other things. So I don't understand this idea that God wouldn't tell us important moral precepts just because we're not adhering to them all. Well, uh, again, this seems to be different in science where we just try to find as like all of the true things that we can. And it seems that what you're articulating looks very different to that. So th this world exists because we've chosen to turn our backs on God and rebel. So he gives us an opportunity to, we're kind of getting into the theology, but an opportunity to try to yeah. fulfill our selfish desires, to try to, you know, be God, have our little apartment, and, you know, be the center of attention in our own little ways. And that doesn't work. You can't have a bunch of people all trying to be God. So that you end up having wars and all sorts of things. So it's more like if it's like, if you have a bunch of people that, you know, all have these bad qualities, you've given them advice to give up those bad qualities. They're insistent on having those bad qualities. So you're just like, all right, well, I'll just take all the people that have the same quality, put them together, and they can suffer amongst themselves until they learn that, oh, actually, I don't want to be like this. And as soon as they learn, as soon as they figure out, I don't want to be like this, then it's like, okay, well, here's how you get out of being like that. Here's the process. And so super soul appears in the heart, you know, guru, guru comes, you're given opportunities to take shelter of this knowledge and it's based on our desire. So, uh, where God is giving us the opportunity, like for us to fulfill our desires, there's some, um, you know, and if it's an ignorant desire, if it's a desire born of ignorance or, you know, something that's not really feasible, then we need to be given a degree of ignorance in order for that to be possible. So just giving us knowledge isn't actually going to transform our heart. Part of transforming our heart is actually letting us realize that what my ideas of how I was going to be happy didn't work. So now let me try God's idea. Right. And this comes because I don't want to debate all of that. I mean, I had a debate about the problem of evil where some of these points came up and maybe we can talk about them in different discussion because, you know, that's, that's sort of yeah, well yeah. away from the just epistemology. I need to wrap up but soon I, too. It's getting really late here. Sure. Yeah. Well, let me let me just finish this this line of thought here. So yeah, I appreciate that's that's going to be linked to your answers to these things. Uh, what I think is interesting about what you just said there is that this idea that, you know, it's, it's sort of trying to to change our character, forget the precise wording you use, that seems to be very different to what we do in science, which it feels like is not really about that. Like, I don't judge the quality of science by the quality of the character of the scientist doing it. There could be someone who's doing great work, but holds these wacky beliefs about other things. In fact, that's quite normal in science um, for scientists to do some good work and then hold strange beliefs about other things. I, I, I feel like there's a great difference between the way we think about the purpose of science and the way we justify knowledge in science compared to the way you've articulated how uh, Krishna consciousness and your worldview works. And so although there may be some parallels, um, I remember uh, Oppie said this, that everything is alike in many ways and, and not alike in many ways as well. I, I think that there are a lot of disanalogies between um, the, the way science operates and the way that um, you articulate sort of Krishna consciousness and, and your worldview operating. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely going to be different. Science is dealing with a mechanical external reality and Krishna consciousness is dealing with a transcendent reality. And the way we yeah, access sure. knowledge for those things is going to be different. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, that there's a further discussion to be had there. But all I wanted to raise there is in response to the point that you made. And I've heard you make another context as well about that in some sense, following the precepts of you know Krishna consciousness is 
scientific in the sense that you know people tell you that you'll have this experience and then you sort of test it out and uh you know you can have that experience and i mean again there may be some analogies there although i would say that probably appeal applies to most other religions as well um but it seems that there's a lot of differences as well and so i don't think i'd accept a, a strong um argument about the congruence of it like a scientific method with with what you've uh, articulated and that in itself is not a refutation of what you said because i'd need i need to appeal to further premises there but i but i do think there's a significant difference there and probably that's going to manifest down the line if we were to you know keep going and discussing why we we differ in what we view about things because i think a lot of the things that you're going to appeal to as justifications or like reasons and so forth ultimately i'm i'm not going to accept because um i do the way i approach knowledge is much more about the way science um not that i think science per se is the only way to know things but i think that so, uh, like a, a science a scientific like methodology uh rough like approximates or is similar to the the way we should approach um um be belief or justification more generally for people interested that this is an idea called epistemology naturalized which quine talked about right i mean i brought up i, st I went off on that tangent about you know the the process of krishna consciousness or where you, where you elevate your you know that the scientific experiment uh, carry out the sardine and see what results you get uh, i brought that up to to talk about you know see how that plugs into coherentism so you know if you get right. all these experiences which are f consistent with the theology being true then at a certain stage you you, you know you you start to attribute yep. a significant probability of its truth and it increases yeah, yeah that makes sense yes time. i agree that that's yeah that that that, that part fits um, obviously, I'm going to have different things to say about specific experiences and and how I would um, explain those experiences. Indeed, even if I did have that, because because I believe that I had religious experiences. Well, I mean, they were experiences, right? So I did have experiences when I was a Mormon, but I now understand them differently. So so there's still a further question about like you know, depending on uh, my other views, how I best account for those. But but absolutely, I mean, I think what you've said is sort of the right approach and then it's just a question of well let's talk about the details of the nature of these experiences and you know a whole host of other things that we, we could talk a lot about in human psychology you appeal to cognitive biases before i think that's also relevant but yeah i mean fundamentally in terms of what you said about how the structure of those experiences all adds to a sort of overall um adding weight to, to the worldview. I, yeah I, I don't have a problem with that right i guess we'll have to do round two um, <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing one of your objections is going to be that the brain's capable of producing those experiences. And, you know, uh, Matt Delahunty talked about priming the pump that you sort of expect these experiences, therefore you have them and so on. I definitely think that's part of it. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the pushback I would offer to the brain producing them argument is if our brains can produce religious experiences, then maybe they can produce our whole experience of all of reality. Well, depending on what you mean, I agree with that um, because I'm a physicalist, right? So, well, I mean, maybe. <laughs> I think all of our experiences are no, I mean, produced by the brain. You know, if you have an experience, why not think that there's an a, an object as that causing that experience? Why think it's just your oh, brain I do. causing it? Well, it's it's the brain and the object well, the, that cause the, that experience. The, the object in the case of religious experience would be spiritual truths or God. Oh, right. I see what you're saying. Right. So, but. Yeah, well, again, it's it's going to come down to the details of the case because a lot of things we experience, I think there is an object of that experience, like the tree example. Uh, in the case of God, obviously, I don't because I don't believe in God. And so you well, they ask, well, why is there a difference? And then we'd have a long discussion about the differences between those experiences. And, you know, you could probably imagine some of the things that I would say about that. And, you know, uh, yeah, I just that's a discussion to have. I, I agree with that. But um, a discussion for another time, I think. All right, we, we'll wrap it up. One person commented that they had experiences as a Muslim and afterwards as a Christian. Both seemed real, except they were contradictory. Interesting. And, and Chris, I would like to know more about that. The, the live chat's probably going to disappear because I usually edit the beginning of the video off and then the live chat goes. So please throw your comments down in the comment section. If, um, I would be interested in talk, discussing this further. So maybe we can do that in the comments because I I, I'm curious to see how, what, religious experiences there are that are contradictory because from a Krishna conscious point of view, we interpret, you know, that there's a God is polymorphic and presents himself differently to people according to their expectations in order to relate to them, you know, in a, in a loving way. So it's not that God just, you know, appears as a flying pumpkin because it's not really that lovable, but you know, maybe if there was a flying pumpkin religion, he might appear as a flying pumpkin because then people might have an emotion of, you know, a loving reciprocation with that kind of form because that's where they've
to vote or their feelings. So uh, Muslims will often see green in their religious experiences because they see green as a sacred color and to people of different faiths will have different experiences. Um, so, but we understand that, like say the Buddhists, you know, or the, the Advaita Vadis, they experience some kind of impersonal ultimate reality. We, we say that there is an impersonal feature to God so, you know, the, the impersonalist can go there and can attain realization of that. We just say that there's something above that. So the diversity of religious experiences and the fact that, and we also say God's present in other religions and reciprocating with people who are members of other faiths. So we don't see any contradiction between Christians and Muslims and Buddhists having, you know, spiritual experiences. We, we just, we have a, an ontology which can explain all of them. Uh, it's funny how every religion does. Um, no, well, a lot well, of religion. No, no, no. I've seen a lot of <laughs> debates and, you know, William Lane Craig and different people are presented just like, okay, well, but what about people of other religions that having these experiences? And often they'll just say, oh, well, they're just hallucinating or is that, you know, that's not real. I've never heard an apologist say that. Usually they'll, well, appeal to different. Anyway, I, I don't even, that's a discussion for another time, but I, I do feel like having an explanation is um, less interesting to me than trying to compare the, um, overall coherence of, of the set of explanations that we receive, because I feel like it's, it's, it's pretty easy to just, um, well, and it, and form explanations for pretty much anything. Like if, if God did appear as a pumpkin, like you can come up with an explanation <laughs> for that. Like, like, no, you could, like, it's yeah. just how plausible is it? So, but what I want to say about this is just that, um, I don't think and this is an important point relating to what we've been discussing all evening, right? That I don't think strictly speaking experiences can be contradictory. Um, again, this probably relates to my, uh, you know, my curiosity, but I think it's the interpretations of experiences that can be contradictory because it's propositions that contradict each other, right? I don't, experiences just are, right? And But we may interpret them in a certain way. The interpretations may, of course, conflict. Um, if we think, for example, that Jesus was the last messenger of God and Muhammad was the last messenger of God who came after Jesus, I don't think you can believe both of those things, at least not without a lot of uh, creative work, which is probably not going to be very plausible. So anyway, I, I think it's always a question about the difference between an experience or a perception or whatever and the interpretation of that. Um, yeah. And the interpretation that to me comes down to our worldview and our set of beliefs, our theology and so forth. And, um, and then how plausible that's, that's going to be. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, my question would be, how is, you know, you, when you want to say that, you know, this is coherent, this, this interpretation of all of it is how we make it all coherent. That's an explanation, right? Uh, yeah. So there, there is a, Coherence will tell you different things when you ask them, what does it mean for beliefs to cohere? So I don't pretend to have a precise answer to this. I think that explanatory, um, that the notion of explanation is the best one that I'm aware of. Uh, so this is, I, I think um, this has been uh, described as uh, explanatory coherentism um, and seems plausible to me, but yeah, there are different models of that, but that's the way I tend to think of it. Let's take the comment away. All right. Um, we'll probably have to wrap it up there. Uh, any final words or oh, anyone have any? No worries. Uh, you mind if I plug my book before we finish? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So thanks very much for having me on. It was a good discussion. I want to emphasize that uh, I was talking about epistemology and we were discussing ideas of foundationalism, and coherentism and justifications for belief. So, you know, there's a whole host of other positions that we could discuss, but um, we didn't. So like, don't try to infer too much about what we're saying if I didn't discuss this or that thing. Um, that's why I said before, like, I wasn't discussing a coherent notion of truth. I was talking about the justification of knowledge. Um, so that's as a caveat. And, you know, I understand that people will disagree and they'll have, there are atheists who are foundationalists and there are probably, um, there are religious people who are coherent. So it, it, you can be in different positions here. And I'm just trying to do my best to understand these things and speaking from what I know. Um, plug my book uh where's the camera there so my book is called oh, having trouble getting it in shot probably because uh, there's still <laughs> there's delay on my end what oh, i'm seeing hang on i can make you there we go um unreasonable faith uh where i talk about william lane craig's arguments for christianity and how i think that they're not very satisfactory um i don't explicitly talk about 
epistemology in this book. Um, but obviously there's uh, and the issue of explanation uh, comes up a lot, actually. So that's one of the, the themes that I think has in common. Um, so if you're interested in some of these issues and maybe understanding some of my perspectives on things like religious experiences as well uh, and psychology and things that I talk about, uh, then, yeah, check that out. Otherwise, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And it was it was a good chat. Cool. Yeah, there's a link in the description to your the, the Godless Theist, your website and to your YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure they can find your book there. Cool. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Oh, oh, oh hang on. <laughs> I've got to stop. <laughs> All right. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is Theology Unleashed. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe so you can see more of our content and let us know what you think down in the comments. Hit that like button and I'll see you on the next stream.